Test, testing, can you hear me? I can hear you, Craig. I like your blue background. Very pretty. It's, it's a curtain. It's a sheet curtain thing. <laughs> Very smart. I've got my rattan thing back there, but um, I don't have enough light, so I have like a lantern for when we go on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And look at Reverend Isom's new fancy photo with the flag in the background. That's styling. Hello. He what is happened to absolutely the, the classiest. That, David, that, was, the, that was the official board picture we got to take when Judith was, was president. Ah. Ah. Okay. I just want to remind everybody that the recording is going to start in like a half a minute and all of this stuff gets recorded. So. Oh, let me get my guitar. I play. Styling face shield, Anna. Oh, I said hot slashes, tell him. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, I'm ready. Am I? Good evening. This board meeting is being held in pursuant to executive order N2920 issued by California Governor Gavin Newsom on March 12, 2020. Any and all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend at the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District Central Office. May we have a roll call? Mrs. Honeychurch? Here. Mr. Isom? Here. Ms. Patero? Here. Ms. Smith? Here. Ms. Tilly? Here. Mr. Wilson? Here. I get a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call. Mrs. Honeychurch? Aye. Mr. Isom? Aye. Ms. Patero? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Tilly? Ms. Tilly? Aye. It says Mr. my microphone's on. Sorry. Mr. Wilson? Aye. We will be adjourning to closed session for discussion and possible action on matters of student discipline personnel, negotiations, and litigation. Do we have any public comments on the closed session agenda? There are no public comments. Thank you. We will adjourn to closed session.
Hi, Megan. Hi, Martha. You're here early. I just want to let you know that the meeting will start, uh, the, they'll come back at six o'clock for regular, um, the regular session. Okay, so should I just go ahead and just come back at six then? You can, you can come back a couple minutes before six if you'd like, then you don't have to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.
This board meeting is being held in pursuant to executive order in 2920 issued by the California Governor Gavin Newsom on March 12, 2020. Any and all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District Central Office um, to observe the, this meeting in public. Madam Superintendent, may we, excuse me, may we st stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. Madam Superintendent, may we have a report of action to take the session? Thank you, President Richardson. In the matter of conference with labor negotiators, no action was taken. In the matter of public employment, it is my pleasure to announce that the governing board acted in closed session to unanimously approve Mrs. Katie Lee as the principal of the Public Safety Academy beginning July 1st, 2021. I just have to clap on that one. Mrs. Lee started her career in 2006 with the district as an elementary school teacher at B. Gill Wilson. She held teaching roles at Oak Brook Academy and Rolling Hills before coming to the Public Safety Academy in 2012. She went on to begin her current role as assistant principal at Public Safety Academy in 2016. Kristen Witt, Director of Secondary Education, commented on Ms. Lee becoming the next principal of Public Safety Academy. We are so excited for Katie to take the helm and build on the exceptional work taking place at the Public Safety Academy. Katie's passion, enthusiasm, and strong work ethic will make her successful in her new role. Ms. Lee attended Coastline Community College, Orange Coast College, and Fullerton College before completing her Bachelor's of Arts degree in Anthropology from California State University, Long Beach. She went on to earn her teaching credential from CSU Long Beach a year later, and in 2012, she earned her Master's of Arts degree from National University in Instructional Leadership. The Fairfield Sassoon Management Team is honored to have Ms. Katie Lee as their as the principal of the Public Safety Academy beginning July 1st, 2021. Congratulations. She's not here, but we'll bring her back when we can in person to meet everybody, but congratulations. We're so excited that she took on this new um, role. And under that was no other action taken in closed session. Madam Superintendent, thank you for that report. Um, today, I'd just like to take the liberty as the president of the board to just give an opening statement. We recognize the significant needs of education for our students in the community. And we understand and have heard hundreds of messages from both parents, even students, um, speaking to us electronically through email regarding their concerns regarding distance learning. And we've also heard um, from some of our teachers. And tonight we recognize that the gravity of a decision tonight may not make everyone happy, but ultimately we need to come together as a community and continue to move forward with the best interests of our students, their education and the future in mind. So just a reminder as well today, this is our first board meeting where we will have a cap at public comments at 30 minutes in totality, uh, where we won't go beyond that for public comment. That concludes my opening statement for today's meeting. We're gonna move forward with item four, communication and information recognitions. And we're going to be introducing the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District's Students of the Month for February 2021. This will be by board member Wilson and board member Chantel, student board member Chantel Martino.
Ms. Uh, Board President, should we go the order that uh, in the agenda or? Absolutely. So uh, Board Member Martino, why don't you begin? Thank you. First, we have Elizabeth Ortega, an eighth grader from B. Gail Wilson Middle School, who has been selected as one of the district's Students of the Month for February 2021. Elizabeth is one of the most hardworking students at B. Gail Wilson Middle School and a role model to her peers. She's a 4.0 honor student, which she attributes to her teachers, Mr. Van War and Mrs. Cortez, who have supported her both academically and in life outside of school these past three years. She also thanks her parents for their constant encouragement. In addition to high academics, Elizabeth is an avid runner. She runs cross country and track, where even amidst social distancing restrictions, her teammates help by encouraging her to continue training. She hopes to make it to Junior Olympics 2021. She also serves in her church as president of the Young Women's Organization and is our school's student leader this year. Elizabeth is uncertain of the career path she might take in the future, but is determined to be a positive contributor to society. She has keen interest in the medical field. We congratulate you, Elizabeth, for being honored today as one of the district's Students of the Month for February. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Richardson, and Governing Board members. I couldn't be more grateful to have this amazing opportunity. I as well couldn't be more thankful to know that even my peers and teachers from Beagle Wilson chose me for the Student of the Year. Looking back to the three years of middle school, I have realized I couldn't do it without the help of my parents, teachers, and my principal, Ms. Dinwiddie. I wanted to personally thank my parents for the many hard decisions that they made for me to succeed. I can say my future is very unknown to me right now, but but I'm very excited for the adventure ahead of me. Thank you again and hope for better days to come. Next, we have Eunice Adelaide, a fifth grader at Cleo Gordon Elementary, who has also been selected as one of the district's students of the month for February, 2021. Eunice is an avid reader and a natural leader. Her teachers describe her as having a strong work ethic, being a deep thinker, and always giving her best effort. Under all that hard work, Eunice is also lighthearted and knows not to take everything too seriously. Above all, she never hesitates to show kindness to anyone and everyone. At Cleo, Eunice had been learning to play the saxophone and hopes to continue this in the future. She's a well-rounded individual with artistic talents as well. We congratulate you, Eunice Adelaide, for being honored tonight as one of the district's Students of the Month for February 2021. Thank you, Board President Richardson and Superintendent Corey and members of the board. I would also like to thank my wonderful principal, Mrs. Dole, and all my teachers in Cleo Gordon Elementary School for all your efforts you have invested in me. Being student of the year makes me feel special and encouraging me to do my best because I know the best is yet to come. This will surely help me to pursue my dream of becoming a medical doctor. I want to thank my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Adelaide for their guidance and love they have for me and my brothers. Once again, I am thankful that you have picked me to be student of the year. It's down for a little bit. <clears throat> Kai Liwag Lindsay, an eighth grader from Virtual Academy of Fairfield Sassoon, has been selected as one of the district's students of the month for February 2021. Kai is an exceptional student at Virtual Academy. Her participation and attendance are outstanding. Her contributions to class discussions and activities are beneficial to the goals of the entire class and have helped foster a safe learning environment and positive classroom community. The quality and depth of thought that Kai puts into her assignments is remarkable. She goes above and beyond 
and holds herself to a high standard of excellence. The work she creates is inspirational as she shows personal expression and challenges new ideas. As an avid reader, active student council member, and recipient of the Principal's Honor Roll Award, Kai is driven and focused. Her aspirations are to attend a prestigious college, promote social equality, care for the environment, and be an inspiration for creativity and wellness to those around her. We congratulate you, Kai, for being honored tonight as one of the district's students of the month for February. Good evening, my name is Kailua Glenzie from Virtual Academy. It is such an honor to be receiving this award. I have tons of goals in life, but my main goal is to go to UCLA. But now I've realized that there's a million of possibilities waiting for me. I'm interested in things like poems, books, and painting. I'd like to thank all my teachers, past and present, who believed in me, and also my aunt and mom, who have given me that little push from the start. Thank you again for this honor. Vanessa Mojica, a fifth grader from Susun Elementary School, has been selected as one of the district's students of the month for February 2021. Vanessa, known affectionately as Nessa, has been a part of the Susun L family since kindergarten. Throughout this time, Nessa has proven to be an outstanding student, friend, leader, and person. Nessa works hard academically, encourages others, and accepts challenges with determination and positivity. She loves math and science, and her favorite book series is Bee and Puppycat. She is often seen drawing, talking with friends, and playing her favorite apps. During distance learning, Nessa has shown her leadership skills by modeling, assisting, and being present for her peers. She answers students' questions and encourages them to keep trying. Nessa also enjoys time with her family, talking, going to the park, and attending church. Nessa plans to be a pediatrician. Nessa shows no matter who you are or where you're from, you can use your voice to take a stand and change the world for the better. We congratulate you, Vanessa Mojica, for being honored tonight as one of the district's Students of the Month for February. My name is Vanessa Mojica. I'm a fifth grader. Being the student of the year is the best gift ever. Thank you to Ms. Swain and to all my teachers that have helped me do my best in school. Thank you for the love and care from my parents each day. Thank you to my wonderful classmates that have made it so fun. Stay safe and remember we are college bound. Moving forward with item C, employee organization report. Oh, excuse me. We will be proceeding to the recognition of classified employees of the year. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Richardson, and Governing Board members. My name is Damon Wright, and I proudly serve as a Director of Human Resources for the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. 
Tonight, we have the pleasure of celebrating our Classified Employees of the Year. Classified employees work behind the scenes, ensuring the daily operations of our district are completed and completed efficiently. And during COVID-19 school closures, our classified staff members stepped up in a heroic fashion to ensure our students were fed, they had access to technology, and made sure our monthly business transactions were seamless. To all FSUSD classified staff, on behalf of our administration, we appreciate you. Governing Board, this evening, we will recognize 17 Classified Employees of the Year nominees and select one nominee to represent our district at the Solano County Office of Education's Educator of the Year event. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce you to our nominees in alphabetical order. Shauna Becker. Ms. Becker is a valued member of our special education department. As a technician, she has mastered our information systems, including CalPADS and SACE. Ms. Becker shares her knowledge and expertise through the facilitation of district-wide trainings. She is conscientious, dependable, and her work is exemplary. Maria Bowden. Ms. Bowden works as a paraeducator in the Resource Center at Cordelia Hills Elementary School. She goes above and beyond the call of duty to meet the needs of students. Ms. Bowden is incredibly resourceful, creative, and innovative in her delivery of information. She is also proactive as she does not wait for problems to surface, but looks for ways to improve the school. Debbie Bird. Ms. Bird is a true leader in our human resources department. She led the planning, training, and implementation of the COVID-19 social distancing fingerprint process. As personnel specialist one, Ms. Bird hires, processes, all of the substitutes and volunteers who enter our district. Her depth of knowledge protects our district from unwarranted liabilities in several compliance areas. Derek Davis. Mr. Davis is the lead custodian at San Nieto at Fairfield High Campus. He is positive, upbeat, and very personable. One cannot walk by Mr. Davis without him saying hello and checking in. Mr. Davis goes above and beyond to complete work-related tasks. He takes great pride and maintains a safe campus for student learning. Mr. Davis is a team player and supports the staff in other areas as needed. Susan Harris. Ms. Harris officially serves as secretary to the principal at Early College High School. As the only classified employee in the office, Ms. Harris also serves as a registrar, attendance clerk, textbook clerk, treasurer, and distributes school lunches. Her versatility and commitment to serving all families is very much appreciated. Grace Holman. Ms. Holman has served as a professional bus driver for our district for over 22 years. She has driven 273,794 miles without an accident, which is equivalent to traveling to the moon and back. In addition to Ms. Holman's focus on safety, she reports to work with a smile and has developed a rapport with colleagues, children, and families. David Knott. Mr. Knott works as a community outreach liaison at Crystal Middle School. He is a community advocate that goes above and beyond the scope of his job to ensure the needs of students and families are addressed. Mr. Knott has made frequent home visits to countless families in our community and re-engaged them in school. Mr. Knott has also coordinated the Crystal Middle School Chess Club. Sarah Kurtz. Ms. Kurtz works as a cafeteria assistant one who greets every student by name as they enter the cafeteria. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck, Ms. Kurtz was the first to volunteer to serve meals and has worked every day since. She has also earned the title neighborhood lunch lady as she addresses parent questions and explains daily operations of the FSUSD food service program. Anthony Lee. 
Mr. Lee works as an itinerant custodian for our district. He is a perfect example of a model employee as his work is exceptional and always completed in a timely manner. Mr. Lee is soft-spoken, comes to work with a smile on his face and a positive can-do attitude. No task is out of bounds or too small for Mr. Lee. He is committed to his vocation and always gives 100% to the task at hand. Tim Lashinsky. Mr. Lashinsky is a groundskeeper within our maintenance and operations department who provides a safe and inviting environment for the school community to be proud of. Mr. Lashinsky takes pride in all aspects of his job, including maintaining the quietest and least seen corners of our campuses to the best standards. He has received compliments and praise from neighbors in our communities. Don L. Long, as a library media technician at Grange Middle School, students and families gravitate towards Ms. Long's can-do attitude. She ensures students have access to supplies and provides personal and school-related guidance. During the COVID-19 school closures, Ms. Long organized, prepared, and delivered supplies to families to ensure students were successful. Martina Parra. Ms. Parra is an invaluable asset to FSUSD. As a CELT technician within our English language learner and instructional support department, Ms. Parra ensures all students and families who require home surveys and assessments are included. Ms. Parra's meticulous record keeping ensures the district remains in compliance with state and federal mandates. JT Patrick. Mr. Patrick works as a computer network technician too, and he truly cares about students. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Patrick reported to the district office and supported students and staff by repairing Chromebooks and laptops to ensure they had the tools to participate in distance learning. Members of the TSS department rely on Mr. Patrick's expertise and appreciate his leadership. Margarita Ponce. Ms. Ponce works as a CASAS assessment, enrollment, and accountability specialist for our FSUSD adult school. Ms. Ponce is dedicated to meeting the needs of students and staff. She is meticulous at collecting data and assessment outcomes which drive adult school programs. She is also a trusted advocate within the community for English language learners. Rosa Sauerwein. While Ms. Sauerwein's official title is Campus Monitor, she is considered a pillar of the Green Valley Middle School community. There is no job at the school that Ms. Sauerwein would not volunteer for. While in distance learning, she continues to check on and advise students and deliver meals. She is also the ultimate problem solver who resolves conflict before it escalates. Tammy Vandergrift. Ms. Vandergrift works as a typist attendance clerk at Rowan Hills Elementary School. She is kind, caring, and always smiling. There is no job too big or small. She will complete it flawlessly. Ms. Vandergrift's calm demeanor brought comfort to many as she led and helped successfully navigate the challenges experienced with the wildfires and rolling blackouts. Betty Y. Ms. Y works as a staff accountant in the business office for over 20 years. Her institutional history and dedication to staff has earned her the respect of the FSUSD community. While Ms. Y is a leader that everyone can count on, as she is very well versed in the business practices, board governance, risk management, and administrative compliance. It is now my distinct pleasure to announce our Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District Classified Employee of the Year, Miss Betty Y. I know she's on our Google Meet here, so we're gonna pin her in just a minute while I talk about her. 
It is my pleasure to announce that Ms. Betty Y has been selected as the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District Classified Employee of the Year. She was selected from 17 candidates nominated from their respective departments throughout the district. Betty is an integral part of our, facility, our fiscal services team, residing in the department for over 20 years. She started in the district as a typist clerk at both Laurel Creek and Oak Brook in 1999, and she moved from the site level into fiscal services in 2003. After serving in multiple roles, account clerk, fiscal services technician, pay payroll technician, and district accountant, she settled in and has served as staff accountant for the past six years. She was born in Iowa and received her associate's degree in bookkeeping and accounting from Western Iowa Techno Technical Community College. And she later moved west to be closer to relatives in Dixon and has resided in the area ever since. In describing Betty for this award, her boss, Assistant Superintendent Michelle Henson stated, Betty's approach and decisions are always forward thinking, focused on the long-term, and ultimately based on what is best for FSUSD. I commend Betty for stepping up and taking the role of district accountant when the district was without one. This flexibility speaks to the team approach Betty takes in fulfilling roles within the district. She's thoughtful, purposeful, and unafraid to address issues when they arise. Director of Purchasing, Ms. Amanda Risch, in support of Betty wrote, Betty's dedication to supporting our schools is unparalleled, and it's because of her excellence in managing ASB and school accounts. She extends such patience and support to all who call on her. Betty is a team player. She's enthusiastically, uh, she enthusiastically embraces the change, and she has an ability to multitask. This and her unwavering commitment always exceeds our customer service expectations. And not only that, if you ever know Betty, she is a wonderful human being and fabulous person, always so kind and generous. The Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District is proud of all of our classified employees, and we're very proud to honor tonight Ms. Betty Y as our Classified Employee of the Year. Congratulations. And I think she has something to say. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Chris, committee members, and who are all the people who nominated me for this award. I'm honored, humbled, and amazed to have been chosen from this group of hardworking and dedicated employees. As I began my 23rd year with FSUSD, I could be the poster child for growth and advancement. I have much gratitude for those people along the way who believed in me throughout the years, enabling me to advance to where I am today. I'm just a no frills Midwest farmer's daughter that was taught solid work ethics to own my mistakes, treat others as I would like to be treated, but to also laugh and have fun at whatever I do. I am fortunate that my job responsibilities are of a wide variety, including making regular visits to the school sites, which has allowed me to build relationships with many of my colleagues. It is those relationships that make my job so enjoyable. I am truly grateful for this recognition but it is shared with my fellow business office team members. We constantly inspire and challenge each other as we continue to grow as individuals and as a team. It is a privilege to be a part of this district and I look forward to continuing my journey with my FSUSD family. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Betty. We know you're gonna represent us very well at the county level. That ends our recognition. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Our board is always excited and thankful for the opportunity to celebrate the achievements of our staff. And this is just another highlight of the value of our district. And for that, we are humbled and honored to have all of the candidates as contributors to our district. 
but as well, we're, we're excited to be able to celebrate the selection of the classified um, employee of the year. So congratulations. We're moving along in our agenda to item 4B, which is the federal program monitoring presentation. We will defer this to Mr. Howard Kornbroom for a presentation. Mr. Kornbroom, you may begin. Good evening, let me pull up the presentation. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Richardson, Governing Board Trustees, Staff and Community. Tonight, I'll be sharing a brief summary of Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District's Federal Program Monitoring and Review, which concluded last week. Federal Program Monitoring, otherwise known as FPM, occurs once every two to four years, depending on the quality of the previous review. The purpose of FPM, which is conducted by the California Department of Education staff, is to ensure the district is compliant and implements all state and federal regulations regarding selected reviewed programs, including appropriate use of designated funds. FSUSD had nine different programs reviewed this year. Each program has an instrument with a number of elements the district needs to provide evidence that we are in compliance. DDE selects a number of schools to review for some of the specific programs. For example, the EL program or the English Learner Program includes a review of the composition and the role of the English Learner Advisory Committees, otherwise known as ELACs, the assessment and identification of EL students, training and roles of our district English Learner Advisory Committee members, and the list goes on and on and on. The English Learner and Instructional Support Department led the FPM review and we began training selected sites and met with various departments months before the actual uh, review week, then uploaded all the hundreds and hundreds of evidence uh, documents for the CDE reviewers. CDE staff not only meticulously, re meticulously reviewed each document, they also conducted one-on-one -on -one and group interviews with parents and federally funded staff. The FPM process touched a huge number of departments and literally every site in the district. The superintendent was hoping I would provide a spent on the FPM process. Honestly, I can't quantify all of the time spent by all the FSUSD staff that was impacted by the review. Literally hundreds of hours went into preparing and conducting the FBM review. And thanks to the effort of the amazing FSUSD staff, we had zero findings. To put that in context, the reviewer said that happens generally five to 10% of the time, but never a district our size. Additionally, the adult ed education reviewer commented, I have never been part of a review where we've had, have not had any findings. I would just say four years ago, when I first participated in training for a review four years ago, they had a, uh, someone presenting from another district who had no findings. And I said, that's going to be our district sometime. And sure enough, actually our reviewers had hoped that myself and Chris Harrison would come and participate in training of future districts who are being reviewed for FPM because of the fantastic job that FSUSD did. Thank you for allowing me to share FSUSD's great news this evening. Thank you, Mr. Kornblum, for that wonderful presentation. If I could just interject for a second, because I want to say a personal congratulations, uh, Howard and team. I have personally, uh, in my day work life, had to go through one of the federal monitorings uh, for a grant that I manage, and that was my full-time job for close to a month. So mm -hmm. I have a deep appreciation for what you guys had to go through and uh, congratulations. My pleasure, thank you. 
Moving to item C. Moving to item C, the employee organizational reports. I do see F. Suda present. Um, we're going to defer to F. Suda president Nancy Dunn for her presentation. If there are by chance are any other employee organization units available, uh, just please make sure that we know so we can recognize you and give you the opportunity to present. And we also have Megan Baker. All right, go ahead. Good evening, uh, President Richardson, governing board members, Superintendent Corey and community. I am Nancy Dunn, president of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified Teachers Association. It is no surprise I'm going to speak on when is the best time to reopen schools. It is very important you hear that this message is framed emphasizing a timeline for reopening because that is what we have emphasized all along, regardless of how others have tried to mischaracterize our position. Over 50 members have emailed you their public comments in the last two days because they could not attend the meeting this evening in person. Your certificated staff, your employees, who are the educational experts, gave their informed opinion that the earliest time to return to in-person instruction is when Solano County is solidly in the red tier and employees who want to receive the vaccination have completed the process. We provided you with the survey data from 80% of our members start, uh, stating an overwhelming 93% united in this position. We are very close to reaching this milestone. In speaking with Dr. Matias yesterday, he stated vaccinations for school employees may begin as soon as 10 days from now. It would take a little over a month from the first vaccination of an employee to complete the process. During the vaccination window, it is projected our county's adjusted case rate will continue to decline, making it realistic to expect Solano County to be firmly in the red tier around the same time the second dose of the vaccine is administered sometime in early April. Currently, other districts in our county have agreements with their bargaining units or are very close to signing agreements, choosing the red tier as the soonest time to return to in-person instruction. Any tentative dates they have published will be delayed if Solano County is not in the red tier for two or three weeks. None are pushing to reopen while in purple. Conversely, we do not have an agreement on working conditions, despite both sides bargaining in good faith. I believe we can all agree it is to everyone's benefit that this situation does not escalate to the point that your certificated staff has to decide to comply with your decision on reopening or not. Clearly, you have a lot of groups advocating for one position or another. An important point of view to consider is to look at the reopening decision through an equity lens. As a board, you have committed yourselves to making decisions to overturn systemic inequities. We are a very diverse district, and we know COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted our Black and Latinx communities. Families of color are not urging for a quick reopening of schools. A recent national poll found 70% of black households with school-aged children said they support or strongly support keeping all instruction online, while 32% of white parents indicated the same. The New York Times reported earlier this month, quote, schools closures have in hit the mental health and academic achievement of non-white children the hardest, but many of the families that education leaders have said need in-person education the most are most wary of returning." End of quote. It is more important to reopen schools correctly than to do it quickly. Distance learning has not been a failure, 
and returning to in-person instruction is not a magic wand. There will be a huge amount of learning time lost with a return to in-person instruction. Schools will not be returning to a school as normal schedule, instruction, or social interaction. Districts that reopened report a sizable dropout of families from in-person instruction when they realize how different the school experience is from what they anticipated. This is why FSUSD is so wise to offer families the option to remain in distance learning for the remainder of the year. The Gen Up survey indicated many students agree this school year should continue in distance learning. If offering the option for in-person instruction is the decision of the board, please remember this is only possible with a teacher in the classroom. We are not only teachers, we are parents, spouses, and caregivers. We want to be with our students and we want to be able to do that without jeopardizing our health or the health of our families. Do not make us choose between our families or our jobs when you can make a decision that makes this a win-win outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Don, for your presentation. We do also have a representative from CSEA, the employee organization, Ms. Megan Baker. You may begin your presentation. Good evening, Superintendent Corey and Governing Board members. My name is Megan Baker, CSEA Chapter 302 Secretary, and I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of Sandy Fallon, our Chapter President, this evening. First, I would like to take a moment to say congratulations to tonight's nominees for District Classified Employees of the Year. It is a well-deserved honor. And a big congratulations to Betty Y for being named District Classified Employee of the Year. Now, since the last board meeting, we have lost one of our members, Linda Samara, who was Secretary for the Maintenance and Operations Department for over 12 years. Linda lost her battle against COVID-19 this month, and we ask for a moment of silence to honor Linda. Thank you. Linda was one of our members who was already physically back at work. In fact, most of our members have been working on site over the past several months throughout the course of the pandemic. For CSEA, the conversation about reopening is less about returning to work and more about the prospect of bringing tens of thousands of students and staff back to campuses. Our staff who work directly with students, such as bus drivers, paraeducators, child nutrition, are most concerned about being in enclosed spaces with students for extended periods of time. And while mitigation efforts are critical, they're not foolproof and they can't be applied in all circumstances. For example, how do we get fresh air on a bus on a rainy day? How do we include students who have a mask exemption but could very well be carrying the coronavirus? How does a bus driver enforce a mask mandate while driving? How do one of, how do one-on-one -on -one paraeducators work with their student while social distancing? Again, we appreciate the depth of consideration that has gone into the planning process, but we know that there are no perfect answers. That's why we are asking the district to wait until one, Solano County enters red tier, and two, our members have had the opportunity to get fully vaccinated. According to the district's own projections, we imagine that could happen mid-March. We see this as an appropriate timeline for bringing back students without endangering the lives of our members who work with students. The district timeline would allow us to work with management on assessing the COVID safety of our sites and have time to make changes based on those assessments. Again, we ask the board to consider our two conditions, one, waiting until red tier, and two, waiting until all staff have have had the chance to get fully vaccinated. CSEA thanks you for your time and careful deliberation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Baker, for your presentation and comments. We do appreciate that contribution to tonight's meeting. We're going to continue to the board student board member report, which we will defer to student board member Chantel Martino. You may begin. Thank you, President Richardson. Thank you and good evening. I would like to start off my report by acknowledging all the student advisory council members. Without them, we would not be able to pursue the initiatives and campaigns that we are working towards this past school year. The Student Advisory Council will meet again next week to discuss ideas for a potential Mental Health Awareness Month or Wellness Week that we would like to host in support of all the students across the district. Distance learning is difficult and we want to be able to provide the resources that students need to be supported mentally during this time. The Student Advisory Council will be having its next presentation to the board on March 11th, where we will be highlighting the solutions that we are working towards in relation to mental health thus far. And with that, I conclude my report. Thank you. As always, Ms. Martino, we thank you for contributing and we thank you for your commitment to the student body of our school district. Uh, we now continue to item E, the superintendent's report. Madam Superintendent, you can begin your report. Thank you, President Richardson. Our district has certainly experienced some sad events recently, which has uh, rocked our district and rocked our community. And our hearts go out to all of those that have been involved and impacted by those situations. I do want to say that I don't want them to overshadow these negative events to overshadow some of the great work that is happening in Fairfield so soon. We've been doing a great job and trying to get them out on press releases. And so um, hopefully you're following us on Facebook and social media so you can find out some of the great things that are continue to happen in Fairfield so soon. I do want to piggyback on what board member Smith said regarding the federal program monitoring um, Mr. Kornblum and his leadership and um, this team made it look almost easy. And as he said, it was countless, countless number of hours. And to have a district our size with zero findings is nothing short of a miracle. So congratulations to them. I'm just going to end my report. I know we have a big agenda item tonight and wish everybody a very safe four day weekend. Tomorrow and Monday are um, non student are not school days. And so we'll see you all back here on Tuesday. Thank you, Madam Superintendent for your report. Uh, we now move to item five, which is our public communication. This is the opportunity for the public to address items that are not on the board meeting agenda. Public comment is only permitted to matters that are within the subject jurisdiction of the board. Uh, for those of you that have a requested to speak, uh, that item, the request to speak form needs to be submitted in advance and speakers are requested to limit their comments to three minutes. The total duration for our public, public comments time period is 30 minutes. There will be a hard stop at 30 minutes. Board Member Wilson, could you please proceed with the public comment? Yes, we have three speakers at this point in the agenda. I will call them in order. Uh, Joan Gott and then George Gwynn. Finally, Cam Holzendorf. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And for those of you that are waiting for your names to be called, when you hear your names in that series, we ask that you begin to migrate towards the public comment section so we can be efficient with our time. Thank you so much.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joan Gott, and I am the president of Music for Our Children. And I'm here tonight because I would like to make the request for a halftime music coordinator. And here are a couple of the reasons why. First, we have a problem. If you look on page five and six of your item 14, which is your in-person learning, you will discover that there's not one single item on there that has to do with PPE for music in any way at all. The PPE that has to be used for music is very specialized. The face masks are very different from what we normally use in our regular day-to-day -day living. The instruments have to be masked and all of that takes money and time. At this point, I can tell you that there are approximately 300 specialized gear that has to be going for the three high schools. That's just the high schools. And this stuff is not inexpensive. So it's something that has to be looked at, but was never, never, discouraged, never discussed. What I'm told is that one of, the, one of our administrators said, no one asked for PPE. Another one said, I've never heard of this. Another one said, it's not needed. Well, yes, it is needed and it's needed very seriously or our kids are gonna get sick. <clears throat> I have samples of masks with me tonight and I'm going to take them out to Rodriguez and give them to Mr. Miller, who's the band teacher out there. The next thing that is of interest is that we still have $62,000 that has not been used to purchase band instruments. And that, re that request and, and uh, budget appropriation was made eight months ago. Nothing has happened with it. We don't know anything about where that money is or what, what is going to happen with those instruments. There is no after school band program in place to date for any of the elementary schools and no music instruction whatsoever is going on at Oak Brook Elementary, which is our visual and performing arts magnet school. How can you have a visual performing arts magnet school with no music instruction. This is silly. Okay, finally, the last thing I would like to tell you is a good thing. Allison Mohofsky, who was recently one of our teachers here in Fairfield Sassoon, was, has joined the United States Air Force Band and just played for the inauguration for our president going out and coming in in Washington, DC. So we have a celebrity that used to work with us. And then finally, I would like to make a request that you seriously look at what's going on with the superintendent's extension request. The last time that this happened, I objected being a board member at that point, and she stated to me very specifically that that was her last extension that she was going to ask for. Now, suddenly, here's another one. You need to look at that because that's, that costs a lot of money. Thank you so much, and I'll see you again in two weeks. Our next speaker is George Gwynn. I just let me put it on before. They build up now, but you have to have a good piece on. <coughs> Makes it even harder to talk. Uh, can I start? Yeah. Um, good evening once again. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the board for at least letting the public show up in, in, in a public meeting. Uh, it doesn't seem uh, too many other uh, government agencies uh, go for that. Um, the thing of it is, is uh, the health of the public is really individual responsibility. The idea that the government's going to solve everybody's problems is not going to work. The, the, COVID thing has gone on for a year and it's been a real disaster for the economy. Um, I don't think anything's gonna matter uh, when the economy totally goes. It's, it's gonna be total chaos and it's gonna be uh, a lot worse situation than there possibly could be from just a few people getting sick. Um, the idea that um, vaccinations are gonna solve the problem doesn't work. Just look at the flu vaccination. They have to come up with a, a, another three um, variants every year, and most of the time they don't guess the right ones. It's, it's the same thing with uh, COVID. What really helps people is that they maintain good health and uh, they get uh, sleep and exercise. And if you do those things, um, most people are going to recover. The idea that everybody's going to live forever is not uh, reasonable at this point in time. And the, the thing of it is, bad things happen occasionally. And the idea that uh, you're going to shut down society to, to compensate for it uh, doesn't work. It, it's certainly been a disaster for a lot of restaurants and um, hair uh, and um, nail cutting uh, businesses. And it's totally unnecessary. Um, 
we really need to get back to the normal, which I'm going to talk about um, later in the um, the meeting. And, and um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, vaccination. Um, the, the vaccines haven't really been tested uh, the way they normally are. It's just the government said uh, it's okay to, to go ahead and take it, but uh, they haven't gone through the same trials that they would normally go through because they haven't had time to do it. And the drug companies are not responsible. They got uh, zero responsibility as far as lawsuits are concerned quite a few years ago. So I, I think the idea that uh, we're going to have a simple fix uh, just by having people get vaccines, it's, it's not going to work. And um, the last thing I want to talk about is that uh, it, there's some work that needs to be done as far as the hearing and visually uh, impaired people. I had bad experience uh, yesterday at the SDA meeting. I couldn't get on the, the meeting because the access code that uh, was printed by the uh, secretary for the SDA uh, was wrong. Fortunately, I was able to get on and uh, use another method uh, later in the meeting, but I missed part of the meeting. And that, it, it, you have some issues with that here. Thank you very much. The last speaker on this agenda item is Kim Holzendorf. No problem. Can I close that? Okay, go forward. There you go. All right. <clears throat> Superintendent Chris Corey, Board President Richardson, governing board members, and everyone in attendance from parents to students. Greetings again. My name is Cam Holzendorf, and remember that's Cam with the K. I'm back to encourage you once again to join our community cleaning crusade and adopt the street in the name of Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. So powerful right there. Just think about it. I'm gonna put this visual on your head. Just think about it as you're on your morning drive, you got out of your house on time, your coffee is just the right temperature and there was no morning traffic. As you're driving up the street of Hillborn before you see this elegant school board building, a regal sign erected by the city of Fairfield, but it says adopted street by the Fairfield to soon unified school district. What a statement that will be towards the community. A message saying that our school board is just invested in the beauty and the functionality of the community, just as the residents. Also, just saying, just putting it out here, it's not too late for you to join our community cleanup as we clean up Ledgewood Creek this weekend from 10 a.m. to noon. And honestly, I feel with the schools possibly opening soon, getting students active now can stave off the struggle of that get back to the real life school mode, along with other huge benefits for the youth by reestablishing that real world routine, foster clean habits, be able to improve their physical and mental health, build strong work ethics, gain community uh, service, learn to love their city, and overall getting the youth excited for new opportunities. Now, I'm not trying to be biased or anything, but this sounds also beneficial all around. I, I hope you consider the invitation, and I hope you take the challenge to adopt the street. Again, the campaign for changes is next community cleanup is February 13th to 2021. That's the day before the biggest love day. So I say, let's go ahead and love on our community together. So we normally clean up the second, the third, and the fourth weeks of the month. And if you guys have any questions for me, you guys can always reach out to me from Cameron, and that's Cameron with the K, H at FSUSD.org. Thank you for your time. Have a great evening. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the public speakers on this agenda item. Thank you, Board Member Wilson. We're moving to our consent calendar, item 6A. Uh, colleagues, are there any items to be removed from the consent calendar? Mm -hmm. 
Move approval. Second, Honey Church. So a first and a second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Martino? Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch? Aye. Mr. Isom? Aye. Ms. Patero? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Tilly? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. That item passes. Moving to item 11A, review and potential approval of the 2020-2021 Western Association of Schools and Colleges WASC mid-cycle report for Armio High School. And we also want to include with this, if we can run these as a slate, item B, review and potential approval of the Virtual Academy of Fairfield Sassoon Advisory Committee's recommendation of school colors and mascot. These two items do not have presentations. Do I have a motion? So moved, Tilly. Second. Do I have any public, have any public comment? Roll call vote, please. Board colleagues, can we confirm the first and the second? I, the motion was made by Helen. I seconded it. Especially on Thank the you. Virtual Academy mascot logo, which is awesome. Ms. Martino? Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch? Aye. Mr. Eistem? Aye. Ms. Vitero? Aye. Ms. Smith? Ms. Tilly? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. That item passes. Item 12, excuse me, item 13. 13A, review and potential approval of resolution 28-2021, authorizing instruction to teach with a variable term waiver. There's no presentation. Do we have a motion? So move. Honey Second. Church. Second, Tilly. Do we have any board discussion? The student board member for financial vote. Aye. Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Huntingchurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Aye. Ms. Patero. Aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Ms. Tilly. Aye. Ms. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, I'm sorry. Aye. Mr. Richardson. Aye. That item passes. We're now moving to item 14A. Excuse me, 13B, review and potential approval of resolution 29, 2021, authorizing employment of an instructor to teach on provisional internship permit PIP. There's no presentation. Do we have any public comment? There are no public comments on this item. Move approval. Second. Ms. Martino. Hi. Okay. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Aye. Ms. Patero. Aye. Mr. Richardson. Aye. Ms. Smith. Ms. Tilly. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. The item passes. Moving to item 14A. This is the review and potential approval of the return to in-person instruction plan. Do we have any public speakers? Yes, Mr. Chairman, 19 people have submitted request to speak forms. I will begin after each speaker. I will call the next two names. First two are Michael Bloom, 
then Jacob Francisco. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And also a reminder to our public, our public comments are gonna be capped at 30 minutes. If anyone expresses similar comments that you would be sharing, we ask that you guys consolidate that effort. We received hundreds of emails regarding this agenda item, and we're taking both the electronic submissions and those that are provided here in public into consideration with our decision tonight. Good evening, Superintendent Corey and board members. I come with good news and a positive attitude. And that good news is that there is light at the end of the tunnel. The positive attitude is that looking all across this country, there is a trend. Yes, we had a hard time in, in 2020 and we're looking through 2021 as in our fight the way away from COVID. You look at the school board in Chicago, they stood firm. I was very proud of them. Uh, and the union stood even more firm. The union said that we would love to be teaching, just like myself as a teacher, I would love to be teaching. Right now, I'd love to be animated in front of my class, pacing back and forth, telling that kid to put away his cell phone and teaching all the things that they need to learn. But teachers are afraid of COVID and rightfully so. Just a day or two ago, people were saying whether or not uh, the former president was on a ventilator. We can't take and risk anything coming from the community, coming into the school and then bringing it back to our loved ones. My wife, I would hate to have that happen. We cannot risk that whatsoever. So that the uh, solution that was brought up by the uh, Chicago uh, Union was that teachers will come back if and only if they are vaccinated and the school district should be responsible for making sure that they get vaccinated. I'm ready to work right now. I'm ready to jump in front and enlighten students as they enlighten me on how to better teach. I want to contribute to everybody here and make the life better for Fairfield and in turn the world. And I'm ready to go only if it is safe. And I'm sure everybody will logically consider that and join with me with the same sentiment. Thank you for your time. The next speaker, Jacob Francisco, then Aldrin Sembrana. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Richardson, members of the Governing Board and members of the community. My name is Jacob Francisco. I'm the president of Generation Up Fairfield Sassoon. The decision that you will be making here tonight will have a huge impact on that, how this school year ends. There's roughly 15 weeks left in the school year. That is roughly four months. We all know that distance learning is not the option that will appease the masses. Instead of basing the decision on what a small group of people want, the board needs to take into account what the student perspectives are. Board member Tilly asked on December 17, if the Student Advisory Council had surveyed the students on their sentiments to returning to in-person instruction. But at the time, the Student Advisory Council did not have the data since their survey was surrounding mental health. Genup, however, did have that survey to get the sentiments of our peers in regards to distance learning. If you recall, the plurality was for the board to postpone reopening plans until the 2021-2022 school year. We again have sent out a survey in which my colleague Angelo Velasco will, have, will be going over in depth in a short while. One of the interesting findings is that a majority of students feel that vaccination should be required for in-person instruction for both students and staff. I know from talking with peers that reopening with less than four months left in the school year is too rushed. Many of the students who have established, have established a schedule in which they follow day to day. Teachers have had their whole lesson plans revised to fit distance learning. Now, if the board decides to return to in-person learning, this will have a major effect on everyone. Students being the group that is affected the most, we will basically have to meet our peers again. After not seeing many individuals for the past 11 months, 
there will most definitely be a sort of relearning of how to socialize. Teachers will have the risk of catching COVID from those that they interface with and have the potential of bringing this virus back to their homes. Parents will also have to get into another routine of going back to in-person learning. All of this is coupled with the fact that if we return to in-person instruction, that will only be for less than four months. That is not plausible. I urge the board to vote to remain in distance learning and reconsider in-person instruction for the next school year. Thank you for your time. The next two speakers are Aldrin Sembrana, then Angelo Velasco. You can take a seat. And then I'll get you framed and then I'll unpause the audio, okay? Go for it. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Richardson, members of the Governing Board, and members of the community. My name is Aldrin Sembrana, and I'm the co-president of Generation Up Fairfield Sassoon. To reiterate, tonight is the long-awaited night for many students, parents, and teachers of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. As my colleague Jacob mentioned before, the board needs to establish a decision based upon the multitude of student perspectives there are. One such perspective is students who decided to utilize their free time to work a part-time job. You see, with the pandemic, there have, been there have been many financial struggles, leaving families who are already socioeconomically disadvantaged to be in worse conditions. That being said, students who took it upon themselves to help out in these situations would be then forced to abandon their family's other source of income if the board decides to reopen schools. Another student point of view to consider is those students who have cautious parents who will not allow them to return unless it is completely safe to do so. The argument against this would be for that student to remain in distance learning, so therefore no harm, no foul. However, there are many complications that can arise from this option. The first one simply being the new adjustment towards accommodating both forms of learning in person and in distance. With the four months we have left in the school year, adapting to yet another new learning format would take time and quality away from actually learning the content well. Additionally, the equity of learning would be different as a result of the contrast in these styles. Perhaps those who are forced to stay in distance learning better thrive by being in the learning environment, but their parents would still not allow them to do so. This is precisely why we as a student body want to emphasize the importance of returning to schools when the vaccines are readily available and have these vaccinations as a requirement for both students and staff. This would provide the confidence that many students, teachers, and others need to effectively, re need to effectively return to in-person instruction. In summation, we should, we should remain in distance learning until the end of the school year. Um, so therefore, I urge the board to vote and remain in distance learning and reconsider in-person instruction for the next school year. Thank you. The next two speakers are Angelo Velasco, then Jack Flynn. Superintendent Corey, Board President Richardson, members of the Governing Board and members of the community, Maya Pabeng. My name is Angela Velasco, Director of Technology at JetUp Fairfield Sassoon. Last week, JetUp put out another survey to gauge the student opinion regarding return to in-person instruction. Once again, we received a great number of responses, and once again, I have the honor of presenting the results to the Governing Board as well as to the public. Our first question was, which of these reopening options do you prefer? The options were taken from the presentation that the governing board gave at their last meeting. 44.8% of students answered that they wish to remain in distance learning, while 55.2% said that when possible, we should allow an in-person learning under the priorities given by the governing board. Second question was, when should the district consider reopening? The results for this question were interesting in that the students were, again, split very closely along the three options given. 
37.9% said that answered that the district should consider reopening in August for the next school year. 24.1% saying that the district should reopen after spring break and 24.1% uh, 32% saying that to open as soon as possible. What does this mean? Well, it shouldn't be surprised the majority of students wish to return in person since learning has been a challenge for the best of us. But students also recognize that a rushed reopening is not ideal and can lead to consequences that could force another closing of schools. Perhaps the most consequential uh, Last question here is, should vaccination be a requirement for in-person learning? And a majority of students, 54.2% answered that yes, vaccination should be a requirement for both students and staff. The recommendations for vaccine distribution as of today is to prioritize high-risk groups and healthcare workers with teachers included in phase two. And students like me, it, uh, in phase three, millions of people in this country will be vaccinated before students and teachers will have the opportunity. While we're coming up on a very bleak anniversary, the anniversary of the closing of schools, I want to remind everyone that there's light at the end of this tunnel. As of this week, both of my parents have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Soon, we'll be able to go back, hug our friends, shake our teachers' hands without fear, but to guarantee that this day will come soon, we need to take the necessary precautions today. I urge the board to vote to remain in distance learning. Thank you for your time. The next two speakers are Jack Flynn, then Doreen Torres. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Richardson, members of the Governing Board, and members of the community. My name is Jack Flynn. I'm a junior at Early College High School and a student ambassador of Generation Up Fairfield Sassoon. I'm here tonight to express my support of remaining in distance learning. As a district, we must remain in distance learning in order to properly and effectively safeguard the health and well being of our teachers staff, parents, guardians, community members, and most critically, our students. While distance learning is clearly not a perfect solution to the situation we find ourselves in, it is a necessary solution in order to ensure that the health and safety of our district remains a key priority. The health and well-being of students has clearly been a top consideration and issue for this district throughout its history. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, this board has spent critical time and resources dedicated to make, making sure students are able to learn safely. This has been shown not just in words, but in the actions of the district. As a Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District student since the fall of 2009, I've always felt that the district genuinely cared about my health and well being and support programs and initiatives to ensure that I learn the necessary curriculum safely. As a student, I'm grateful for this dedication the district has shown. I believe that it must be a top priority for students to be healthy and learn safely. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown to be tragic and has devastated our local community and our school district, families, friends, and community members who have lost a loved one know firsthand of the real and present danger that COVID-19 has. The medical experts and scientists have told us that schools can still spread COVID-19 even with thorough protections and provisions. As a school district, we must solidify our solid commitment to protect and ensure our students' health and well-being. By remaining in distance learning, this district would be keeping our students' health and well-being a top priority. In conclusion, I wish to reflect upon the mission statement of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District, which reads, quote, in a safe, welcoming and supportive learning environment, we provide innovative 
educational opportunities to develop resilient students who are inspired to succeed. It is clear that distance learning is the only learning environment that will adhere to this mission statement and provide a safe, welcoming, and supportive learning environment for our students. Thank you for your time and consideration. The next two speakers, Doreen Torres, then Reese Fisher. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Corey. My husband and I have spoken at several of these meetings. We have sent countless emails. We've even started a parent Facebook group that has about 400 members now. And here we are again to address you. Almost an entire year has gone by since my children have stepped foot into a classroom. A year. I can't even begin to fathom how they're feeling, what all 20,000 plus students of this district are feeling. I would guess that they're feeling abandoned, that they're feeling scared, worthless even. Why would I assume this, that they're feeling this way? Because that's what the emergency rooms and mental health departments across the state have been hearing. I emailed you all a news article last week written by Alice Kuo, a professor and the chief of medicine pediatrics at UCLA. The data she shared in this article regarding the decline of children's health was unbelievable. Just here in Northern California, there are hospitals that have seen a 75% increase in the number of children brought in for emergency mental health services that required immediate hospitalization, 75%. I saw a post on the FSUSD Facebook page. It was just an announcement that we don't have school tomorrow or Monday in honor of President's Day. The post quoted Abraham Lincoln. It read, the best way to predict the future is to create it. How in the world are children expected to create a future with such an impaired opportunity to learn? Distance learning is not an adequate form of education. That's been proven. It requires isolation, staring at a computer all day. It causes vision problems, migraines. It allows intruders to log in with obscene and pornographic content. So allow me to predict the future for you. If you don't open schools and provide an opportunity for a real education for our kids, the future you will then create will be one filled with child depression, anxiety, obesity, and suicide. It doesn't take a profit to predict this future. It has already began and it will only continue to worsen. I am a woman of faith. So I have been praying since March for some type of solution for a cure to this virus. Although we don't have a cure yet, scientists and doctors have come up with some solutions. They've declared that wearing masks and washing your hands can help prevent spreading. They've even recently come up with a vaccine. I've also been praying for you board members, but I'm not asking God to give you the knowledge to come up with a solution or a cure of some sort. I'm simply asking him to provide you with eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to truly care because the solution to this problem, the cure for this crisis is right in front of your faces. The proposed plan offers in person for those who need it and virtual for those who are not ready to come back. Please do what is right make the decision to open our schools and give our children an honest chance to become our future and not just another sad statistic that we'll read about in the news. Thank you. The next two speakers are Reese. I'm going to wipe it. The next two speakers are Reese Fisher, then Jace Parkinson. If we could just take a brief moment, I just want to remind the public that this is a meeting of the board in public. I would like to request just because of the concerns regarding the tensions between both sides that we not have applause in between public comments, just out of respect of opposing views to ensure that there's not um, any type of conflict while we're attempting to conduct our meeting. Hello, in school board and superintendent Corey. My name is Reese Fisher and I'm a, and I am a new seventh grader at Green Valley Middle School. Because of the pandemic, I have never been to school grounds. I feel very sad that I have never met such seen all of my teachers and classmates due to the fact that more than three quarters of my classmates 
do not turn on their cameras, and one of my teachers has not even turned on their camera since the beginning of this year. When we were still doing school, I was a straight A student, but this year things have changed. Now my grades are really low and I have no determination to get my to get good grades because in my opinion, what is the point? I have two siblings and one of them is in their first year of high school and their first year of middle school. Because of, because of all of us are on the Wi-Fi at the same time, we are constantly logging out of our classes and by the time we get back into our class, it is ended. Think about it. Imagine walking with no motivation and still having to get ready to walk into another room and look at a screen all day. Before online school, parents were constantly telling us to play outside. Now we are being told to sit on our computers and phones all day, and we are getting zero to little time to play outside. If, if you think it's dangerous, why? Because science states that kids are not super spreaders. If you let us go back to school, I will gladly wear a mask and and um, as long as I get to see my best friend and meet new people. In regard to the survey that Gen Up um, group has sent out, I never received it. I like, to, I, like, I like to know how many kids actually completed it. Nobody is going to force you to go to school if you're not ready to. The reopening plan, um, the reopening plan allows you to confine uh, distance learning. Thank you. The next two speakers are Jace Parkinson, then George Gwynn. Good evening, board members and members of the community. My name is Jace Parkinson, and I'm the freshman class president of Rodriguez High School. Thank you for allowing me to share my perspective on the return to in-person learning. We're nearly a year into the pandemic, and we have learned so much that we didn't know from last March. Information recently published from Duke University, American Pediatrics Association, and the CDC showed that returning to in-person can be done with proper safety measures in place. We are seeing new strands develop, and it looks like COVID isn't going away anytime soon. We have to learn to coexist with the virus. Closer to home, Napa Unified is operating with a hybrid plan. Several private schools in our county are in person, and so are daycare facilities. We even have supervised workspace opportunities available at most sites in our own district right now. In these examples, no substantial outbreak has occurred, and our county cases per 100,000 are declining. The district has distributed $2.6 million worth of PPE to our school sites in January. This puts us in a very good position to proceed with safe in-person learning. If we do not go back in some sort of in-person learning, that's a lot of PPE and money sitting wastefully unused. Meanwhile, although I'm doing okay, I see the unintended setbacks happening all around me and we should all be concerned. I'm noticing student engagement is ridiculously absent in my classes. Some of my teachers are literally begging students to turn in work by offering full credit for assignments way past their due date. Students are consistently absent or signing on to class late, and several classes have been hacked with inappropriate disruptions. Data shows that more students are more at a risk of falling behind or suffering from mental health than the virus itself at this point. The toll it's taking on my friends and classmates is deeply concerning to me. I am seeing firsthand students who were once cheery and outgoing, turning into withdrawn former shells of themselves. Information published from John Hopkins All Children's Hospital shows an increase of children who needed mental health assistance compared to 2019 and an uptick in suicide attempts as well. In terms of quality education, it is though we are basically checking the boxes, but not much more. Although teachers are trying their best, it is simply not working well, and this is not the education that we the students deserve. Many of my peers are wanting to go back, but feel their voices haven't and won't make a difference. I do understand there are families and teachers whose top concerns of transmitting COVID and they should absolutely have the option of distance learning. But please, let's meet all families and offer in-person learning. As I stated before, we have to learn to coexist with the virus. The science and data collected over this last year show it can be done, leading experts agree, neighboring districts and schools within our own county are evidence. Bold leadership is needed now more than ever and myself and my peers are relying on you. Thank you. 
The next two speakers are George Gwynn, then, then Garrett Borges. Good evening once again. Um, I, I uh, totally agree with the previous speaker. Um, this is supposed to be a um, um, constitutional republic and a constitutional republic. Um, the uh, big don't always uh, trample with the small. So in other words, if you have 55% uh, says something, then they always win. Whereas in a constitutional uh, republic, uh, small states like uh, Wyoming or Montana still get a say in things. We're not a democracy. Uh, democracy is the big stop, stops the small. And um, it's been a year that things have been shut down. If people don't want to go back to school, that's their choice. Um, the idea that you force people to get a vaccination or, or go to school when somebody else says so is ridiculous. So there's private schools, there's home schools, there's uh, over the internet schools, there's all kinds of uh, choices. So I think that this district needs to get back to in-person learning uh, the sooner the better. I understand that the, the governor's uh, roadblock as far as uh, this uh, board is concerned, but uh, we're almost uh, to the recall point. We only need 100,000 more signatures and I have uh, some um, blank signature um, things for people if they want to do a, a recall of the governor. I think that that would certainly help things. But um, the idea of forcing people to do stuff is not what this country is supposed to represent. And um, you should be giving people as many uh, choices as possible. Also, the younger people don't seem to have that high of uh, infection rate as far as COVID is concerned. I'm in my late 70s. I can't even remember when the last time I had a cold. And if I had COVID, I wouldn't be here. That, it's, a lot of people know I don't miss very many meetings. And it's because I have other meetings to go to usually if I do miss a meeting. It's not because I have sickness. So the idea that just because people were old means that they have COVID is not uh, true either. But uh, the thing of this is uh, this thing needs to be wrapped up soon. It's the district, uh, private businesses, all kinds of people have lost a ton of money. A lot of it's been unnecessary. People lost their businesses. A lot, a lot of problems because of fear mongering and the fear mongering needs to stop and people need to get back to, to work again. You get uh, people making money, I think they'll be feeling better and um, problems will go away. But as long as you keep going uh, downhill, things are going to get worse. So that needs to stop. Enough is enough. Thank you very much. The next two speakers are Garrett Borges, then Rebecca Grasty. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, sorry if my baby was interruptive. You've got a bit of a glimpse into what my son has to deal with every day working from home. Uh, I'm here tonight because my seven-year-old first grader asked me if there was anything I could do to help get him back to regular school. As a parent, nothing hurts more than to hear the plea of your child but not have the ability to help. I've tried by email and phone to ask the board and school teachers for in-person learning to resume. I've looked to transfer my son to costly private schools so he can join the children who are thriving in classrooms, surpassing the education and development of our children who are forced by this board to stare at a computer screen all day long. Unfortunately, 
Not all of us can afford a $1,500 a month private school tuition and our hearts break that we can't provide our children with the same opportunity as those children who get to learn sitting beside their peers. I felt helpless in seeking better distance learning alternatives for my son. Admittedly, I gave up as we were repeatedly told, trust the science, give it a chance, or we are following the governor's rules. I've always felt the distance learning would take a dramatic toll on our children and that the negative impacts would outweigh the threat COVID creates for in-person learning. Unfortunately, the latest news and information coming in seems to confirm my fears. Yet we continue to debate if it's time to come back to the classroom. Each of you represents our voice and our community. We voted you into this position of power and to fight for what is best for our children, despite what the governor or the teachers unions are advocating. I know you, I, I now ask you to follow the science, to give it a chance, to be our voice against those trying to harm our children by keeping them out of the classroom and to utilize the tax funded improvements already installed to keep our kids safe in class. We know the risk of keeping our children out of school is greater than the benefits of keeping them in. The tide has shifted. Vote to prevent another avoidable suicide. Put our children first and put them back in classrooms. Your turn, bud. I wanna go back to school because I don't get to see my friends very much. And I want to go back to the playground and play tag with my friends. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, should I continue? Yes, sir. We have time for one final speaker. The, the last speaker, Rebecca Grasty, on this item. Since you're still in distance learning with me, please make sure your camera's on to receive credit for attendance for today's synchronous time. I'm concerned about some of the board members that are still refusing to earn camera attendance credit, demonstrating a lack of active listening, excuse me, resulting in a disconnection with the audience and the public speakers. Mr. President, I thank you for your response to the inquiries from the community. The majority of your members have also been very responsive to the public and that they've elected to serve. But there are still members that have refused communication with the public for months. Tonight, as we're all here for, is the vote. In addition to the CDC director, as far back as June 2020, we watched the Secretary of California of Health and Human Resources Services, Dr. Galley, on October 6th, say there's no correlation between students attending in-person learning and a spike in COVID cases. This was ignored two days before the previous FSUSD vote on October 8th. The CDC Director Emily Oster of Brown University, Catherine Strzok of Michigan State, Tulane University, Douglas Harris, and Duke University says the spread of COVID from child to child and child to adult is very rare and have all joined this opinion and backed it up with science. The latest is from February 4th, examining the YMCA of the Triangle Day Camps at 31 sites in six counties in North Carolina. Dr. Sally Permar is the chair of the Department of Pediatrics of Well Cornell Medicine, pediatrician in chief at New York Presbyterian, Will Cornell Medical Center, and New York Presbyterian Kamansky Children's Hospital, and a co senior author of the study. She quotes The results suggest that the benefit of in person programming for youth learning and mental health, particularly in vulnerable population, outweighs the risk of viral spread. She continues on. This is true in a school setting, but also in a camp setting where children are engaging in activities like playing outside and at the gym and doing crafts. We are not all in the same boat. No, we are not. We are all in the same storm, but we are not all surviving. Those who choose to be able, 
to exercise their child's right to a free and appropriate education should be given that opportunity. Distance learning is preventing students from adequately learning what they need to in order to score high test scores that are needed to apply within district schools. Something I've noticed, board members are given the privilege to attend virtually and even vote. Public speakers should also be given that privilege. Please don't ignore the science this time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the seven remaining speakers will not have the opportunity to speak at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Wilson. At this time, I want to defer to the presentation that will be conducted by the Secretary to the Board and her or and her designee, Ms. Chris Corey. Thank you, Board President Richardson. I did want to just mention that I love tonight watching public comment because I know how this is a very emotional subject for everybody. And you here tonight modeled respectful behavior despite some very differing opinions. And I want to just commend you for that tonight. So here we are again. Seems as if every time we tend to do this presentation, some news comes down from the state or from the um, governor that side rails are planned. So what I wanna make sure everybody knows is tonight's vote may change. We are expecting some updated CDC guidelines and also some potential legislation from the state. Um, we thought it was gonna come earlier this week, but we heard that it may be here as early as tomorrow. So even though our board is considering this and taking action, just keep in mind that 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 might be taken away from them um, and their ability, uh, depending on what happens at the state legislature. I'm gonna have you go to the next slide, please. That just show, next slide, please. Thank you. Things will change, we know that. Um, I was reminded earlier that the only things that really like change are, are babies, and it usually involves a diaper. So. Um, this has been rough for many people because we know that we have been having to adapt to continuous change um, each and every time we bring this presentation forward. Next um, slide, please. Have the next slide, please. Thank you. Some of these slides are review. You have seen them numerous times. Airfield Sassoon has purchased um, nearly $2.7 million worth of personal protective equipment and safety equipment in anticipation of one day returning to in-person instruction. And you can see the list here. Next slide, please. Here are just some lists of some personal protective equipment and safety equipment that is available. I did want to put out um, to point out that there is an air purifier that we have purchased, one for every teacher's classroom. And um, on the air purifier, it says for household use only. And we checked, um, we checked on that and they said, and the manufacturer said, no, it's actually uh, refers to indoor use. And it's a solid choice for businesses and schools. And it's one of the very few purifiers certified as a class two medical device um, by the FDA. So I wanted to point that out on this slide. Next slide, please. You can see some of the Cal OSHA site-specific plans. Um, we submitted ours, it's been on our website. We've completed this and you can see some of the things that we had to address. Next slide. This is an update about vaccinations. And I, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with our Solano County Public Health Officer, Dr. Machas about vaccinations. And so um, a, a while back, they said that they anticipated vaccinations for the general public as early as um, March or April. Um, there's a lot of confusion around vaccinations because it differs from county to county. And as you may be aware, the first priority is for healthcare workers 
um, and emergency response folks. And Solano County is very fortunate to have many of those people that live and reside in our county. And so um, that first level of vaccine, um, when we had it first out, we weren't even able to vaccinate all of our health workers. And so some of this is about supply and how much um, supply is, is provided to our county. Um, so you can see some of the things that are right now currently. Um, the vaccine is not a condition for employment for school distri districts, and it is not a condition for school enrollment. Next slide, please. As of last Friday in our conversations with Dr. Machas, um, he anticipated that the first shot will be available uh, to those who work in education, hopefully as early as next week. And by mid to the end of February, he believes those um, 65 or older will have had the opportunity to receive, receive at minimum that first shot. Uh, by mid-March, he anticipates that all district staff should have the opportunity to have been have received both both vaccinations. Um, and as I as I want to remind the board, there is no requirement for staff to receive this vaccination. They can disclose whether they've received it or not. Um, we are really trying to work closely with Solano Public Health to set up locations throughout the county. I have been the first to raise my hand every time and said, pick Fairfield so soon, we'll find you a place. Let's set up a vaccine clinic and let's get going. Um, but they are anticipating that there will be three site locations in the county um, that will be solely to vaccinate those who work in education. And, and there is anticipated to be one in the South County, one Mid County and one North County. Um, we had on here that uh, by, by this week, actually, uh, Solano County anticipates to uh, be re reaching the 25 to 100,000 um, ratio that would allow um, TK through six to be open. It's also anticipated if our county continues on the trajectory that we currently are uh, moving, uh, where things are improving, case rates are improving, the um, ICUs are, have a more capacity that we should be able to uh, look at the red tier uh, by beginning or mid-March. Next slide, please. I am gonna now turn this over to Angie Avalanitas, and she's gonna talk about the required notifications that happen um, with exposure. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. There are several notification requirements related to COVID-19. Employees must be notified in writing within one business day if we have knowledge that they may have been exposed to COVID-19 in the workplace. The employee's labor representative is also notified of potential exposure. Both students and staff are notified by phone as soon as possible and always before the end of the day, including weekends and non-work days, if they are identified as a close contact. Employees will also receive a potential exposure notification. We are responsible for reporting to Solano Public Health the names of our students and staff who are confirmed positive for COVID-19. In addition to notifying public health of staff who are confirmed positive, we are also obligated to notify our insurance provider, NBSIA. In the event there's an outbreak, we're required to notify public health with the information detailed before you within 48 hours. As we consider the return of our students and staff, it is important to understand that based on the CDC's definition of a close contact, there may be instances where we are required to close classrooms. Individual classrooms may be closed if and or when staff are identified as a close contact to a person who is confirmed positive with COVID-19. Any decision to close a classroom will be made in consultation with the principal, human resources, and educational services. In order to ensure that classrooms remain open, we rely on our staff to follow distancing and mask protocol. 
short-term exposure of less than six feet between students and staff are permitted. For example, a teacher assisting a student one-on-one, -on -one, but the duration should be minimized and masks must be worn. Individual school closures may be appropriate when there are multiple cases in multiple cohorts at a school or when at least 5% of the combined total number of students and or staff cases within a 14 day period, depending on the size and physical layout of the school. An entire school district may close if 25% or more of schools in a district have closed due to COVID-19 within 14 days. While the California Department of Public Health defines an outbreak as three or more confirmed probable cases of students or staff occurring within a 14 day period, a decision to close schools will be made in consultation with public health. At this time, I would like to offer the opportunity for our board to ask any clarifying questions related to slides five through 12. Board colleagues, does anyone have any clarifying questions regarding items five through five through twelve? I see none in a virtual space. Ms. Avenida, she in preparation for the potential return of in-person instruction, both elementary education and secondary education assembled committees to develop hybrid schedules. Maybe the teachers of five staff site level administrators, central office administrators, and FSUDA representatives. We gave the committee two non-negotiables. One was that the schedules had to contain the minimum number of daily minutes required by the state. And two, the plans had to provide families with the option of either returning for in-person instruction or to remain in distance learning. This point cannot be understated. In both elementary and secondary plans, the parents have an opportunity to decide if they want their children to remain in distance learning or to return for in-person instruction. With a focus on those we serve, both elementary and secondary ed committees created schedules which resulted in the least amount of disruption for students by being able to remain with their current teachers no matter if the family, no matter if the family selected in-person instruction or distance learning. Finally, it's important to note that the committees gathered input from other school districts who have already opened for in-person instruction, as well as visited some school sites to learn what's working and what areas they might have handled differently. While the plans are reflective of what we believe is best for our students today, we recognize that the actual implementation might need to be fluid and flexible based on the number of students who plan to return, the facility capacity given some of the criteria established by the state and any changes to the guidelines from the state legislature, the California Department of Public Health, or Cal OSHA. The slide before you is a sample of a schedule agreed to by the Elementary Education Committee. Families selecting to have their children return for in-person instruction would follow Schedule A, where their children have 150 minutes of in-person instruction daily and the remaining would be provided through asynchronous instruction. Families selecting to have their children remain in distance learning would follow Schedule B, where 100% of the instruction would be provided through virtual synchronous and asynchronous instruction. We recognize that this plan may be more challenging for our teachers than being in 100% distance learning or 100% in-person instruction. However, we also believe that our students have built relationships with their teachers and we want to, to the best of our ability, allow our students to remain with their current teachers for the remainder of the school year. Given the social emotional stress that our children are experiencing, we believe this model is in the best interest of the children and families we serve. Given the number of students on a comprehensive secondary campus and the added movement from one class period to the next, the plan for secondary students looks much different than for elementary students. Students would remain in distance learning in the morning where they would complete the required instructional minutes. In the afternoon, teachers would provide in-person support 
for families wanting to have their children receive in-person instruction. In this model, students in self-contained special education classes would have the opportunity to receive in-person support five days a week. It's also important to note that this schedule cannot start until the county moves into the red tier and remains there for at least five days. During the last governing board meeting, staff provided the most up-to-date athletic guidance issued by the California Department of Public Health and the California Interscholastic Federation, or CIF. The slide before you is the one that we shared at the last meeting, which outlines league sports that are allowed per tier. The Monticello Empire League, or MEL, consists of two high schools in Vacaville Unified, a high school in Travis Unified, and the three comprehensive high schools in Fairfield Sassoon. Staff from Armio, Fairfield, and Rodriguez have participated in MEL meetings over the last few weeks to create athletic schedules that meet the CIF and SAC Joaquin guidelines. One might look at the schedule and ask, why aren't we starting all of the sports that can start in purple right now? Given the condensed timeline for athletic competition and the goal of giving students the opportunity to participate in multiple sports, MEL representatives attempted to create a schedule that staggered sports in such a way that multi-sport athletes may be able to play in two sports between now and the end of the school year. Immediately following our last board meeting, our site principals and central office staff started putting together plans in place to meet these timelines. It's important to note in the spirit of things will change, we received word yesterday that the state and CIF will now allow students to participate in multiple sports at the same time. We do not anticipate that this will change the MEL schedule. Rather, this new ruling has to do with students being able to participate in a high school sports team and a club sport team at the same time. We also wanted to provide you an update regarding marching band. As of the January 14th guidelines from the California Department of Public Health, it stated that outdoor singing and band practice are permitted, but the use of wind instruments is strongly discouraged. We are aware that some other school districts have purchased specialized equipment, protective equipment for the musical instruments to minimize the aerosol spread that occurs when playing a wind instrument. In meeting with music directors earlier this year, and I should point out that's with the high school music directors, <clears throat> Excuse me. it was determined that it was best to hold off on purchasing the instrument mask. As such, the wind instruments are not being used when gathering for in-person rehearsal. We did just start re-engaging with this discussion with our band directors. Currently, two of the three high school band directors are meeting, with in, per are meeting in person with students. At this time, I'd like to offer the opportunity for the board to ask any clarifying questions regarding slides 14 to 18. President Richardson, if I may. I cannot stress enough that we have to be fluid and flexible. As Dr. McCabe mentioned, um, this is our first time, if we were to, uh, if the board chooses to reopen, this is our first time reopening in a pandemic and under these conditions. We know how to reopen school we, uh, um, in normal circumstances. We've done it for many, many, many years and we're pretty darn good at it. So we just need the board to understand um, and our community to understand that all of this has to remain flex and fluid. This is our plan, best laid plan right now, but should we get into in-person instruction and need to adjust accordingly, um, we may have to do so as far as schedules are, are concerned. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, any board colleagues have any clarifying questions regarding slides 14 through 18? Okay, I do would like I would like to say that um, I I really appreciate uh, the superintendent's comment just now because it's important to know um, I share with her. Um, that is going to be important for us as a board if things change significantly that's outside of our scope of control that we make arrangements um, for our board to meet for a special board meeting so that it is not prolonged any future decisions if that be necessary so it speaks to what the superintendent has mentioned regarding our ability to be fluid and flexible 
And it's another level of commitment that we need to make to ensure that we can help to restore education um, in the best way possible based upon the protocols that we must govern ourselves with. Uh, so with that, we can proceed with the presentation. Thank you. As of tonight's governing board meeting, the governor's Safe Schools for All plan has yet to be passed by the California legislature. As we proceed through the next 12 slides, please be mindful that we've listed anticipated dates based on information and data trends discussed during our meeting last week with Solano Public Health. Last Friday, when this board agenda item was posted, we provided the data trends before you related to our adjusted case rate. As the board can see, we've had a steady decline in our adjusted case rate. When the state released updated data this Tuesday, February 9th, Solano County's case rate dropped to 26.9. We were actually notified yesterday, Wednesday, that Solano County's adjusted case rate dropped to 21.6, meeting the 25 to 100,000 ratio needed to open pre-K through sixth grades while in the purple tier. Solano Public Health will now review our COVID-19 safety plan. Following the January 28th board meeting on Monday, February 1st, our COVID-19 safety plan was posted on our website, routed to Solano Public Health, to the Solano County Office of Education and the state's Safe Schools for All team. Please remember opening in the purple tier no longer requires small group cohorting maximum of 14 students. By the time of this evening's board presentation, we know there are currently 13 private and or charter schools that are open in Solano County. The next eight slides will highlight the return to in-person instruction options for the board to consider this evening. Option one, return to in-person instruction in the purple tier as soon as case rate criteria is met. Should the board select option one, your team will begin week one bringing back students with disabilities and preschoolers. We anticipate this to occur by March 1st. Week two, scaffold in transitional kindergarten and kindergarten. Anticipated start date is March 8th. Should the current trajectory continue, we anticipate being in the red tier by March 16th and under option one, would continue to scaffold in grades one through three during week three, then grades four through six, for sixth graders at our K-8 elementary school sites by March 22nd. Option one is continued on this slide 25. And with the anticipation of being in the red tier by March 16th, we would bring back grades seven through eight at our elementary schools that have grades K-8 and implement the secondary plan. A reminder of the conditions we must meet in order to open in the red tier. We must maintain a case rate of less than seven per 100,000. And again, as of yesterday, this is down to 21.6. Have a test positivity rate between five and 8%. And as of this Tuesday, we met this requirement and our rate is down to 6.3%. Post and route our COVID-19 safety plan, and this has been completed. In order to open in the red tier, we were only required to be in the red tier for five days. And this is a change from the previous guidance, which was 14 days. As previously mentioned, we anticipate being in the red tier as early as March 16th, and we may open in any configuration. Option two for the board to consider is move to reopen for in-person instruction in the red tier as soon as case rate criteria is met. Should option two be considered using anticipated dates, 
we recommend a scaffolded approach beginning with week one, bringing back students with disabilities and preschoolers. Next slide. That would be by March 22nd. Then bring back, sorry, back to slide 27. Then bring back grades TK through three during week two, and the anticipated date for that would be March 29th. Grades four through six for sixth graders at our K-8 elementary schools and implement the secondary cohorts with an anticipated start date of April 12th, which is upon our return from spring break. Red tier option two is the option our FSUDA president Nancy Dunn asserted during the January 14th board meeting that we should adopt to return for in-person instruction in the red tier, allowing everyone to plan and prepare, but there was no need to procrastinate. Next slide. In the orange tier, we must maintain a case rate of less than 3.9 per 100,000 and have a test positivity rate between two and 4.9%. Post and route our COVID-19 safety plan, which your team has completed. In order to open in the orange tier, there is no waiting requirement. We anticipate being in the orange tier as early as April 20th, and we may open in any configuration. Option three for the board to consider is move to reopen for in-person instruction in the orange tier as soon as orange criteria is met. Your team continues to recommend a phased in reopening plan for this tier and option. While the surveillance testing requirement is being discussed by the California legislature as of this evening's presentation, it is our understanding that if schools open under the governor's grant-based plan, districts are required to offer surveillance both asymptomatic and symptomatic to persons attending in-person instruction. For those schools that do not open under the grant-based plan, the district may refuse to ask to their medical provider or public health for testing. For students and staff who are interested in taking a COVID-19 test using the testing machines provided to us by Solana Public Health, those testing machines are available at every elementary school and K-8 site and in the Human Resources Department. Students and staff who are participating in in-person instruction may elect to take a COVID-19 test using one of the machines provided to us by Solana Public Health and a consent form is required to be completed. This requirement is subject to change. In researching to prepare for what testing would cost, should this become a requirement, the average cost per test is roughly between 80 and $100. So what would this look like when applied? As an example, for every 5,000 persons, students or staff, we test weekly, the cost would be approximately half a million dollars expenditure ongoing weekly. If we have March 1st as a start date, there would be 13 weeks remaining in our school year. Option four for the board to consider is to move to main, remain in distance learning for the remainder of the 2020-2021 school year. Please note that small group instruction, assessments, and athletic competitions will continue to occur if option four is selected. While your team has provided the board with anticipated dates for reopening, Reopening dates for in-person instruction will be determined based on the board's decision this evening and our county's movement between the tiers. This evening, your team has shared the most up-to-date information related to the return to in-person options, which the governing board may consider. This time is now reserved for board discussion and action.
I just want to mention and thank our staff for their work on this. We have developed many plans since we closed school March 13th, a year ago. Um, and many of those contingency plans have never been implemented. So there was a lot of planning only to not implement. And I just want to thank them for their um, hard work on all this and their flexibility and their fluidity. Um, usually by this time of year, we are well into um, planning for next year. The current year is usually on autopilot and we have everything taken care of. Um, so this is the this has been uh, quite the challenge. And I just want to say thanks again to the staff because we're planning for the current year while we're also continuing to plan for the upcoming year. Um, I just also want to mention and um, reiterate about the surveillance testing. We have heard that that may change and it may be a um, one of the things that the legislature is considering for reopening. So if that's the case, um, you know, we'll have to budget that accordingly. Should we not qualify if there's no competitive grant, we will have to ha have that as part of our budget. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, President Richardson. I believe is, is Miss Tilly on here? I, I don't know. She's been having internet issues. I am here, Superintendent Corey. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Thank and you. she has her Perfect. Hand. I have my hands up. Okay, just one second. So I I I wanna echo the sentiments of our superintendent um to our district staff um and the team responsible for quite some time of developing and revising and redeveloping and revising um what we now see as options for our reopening. Um, I am uh, I am greatly appreciative of all of your contributions, um, and I'm sure the late nights and sacrifices that each of you have made in an effort to make sure that we've had the most current information possible to be able to make the most informed decision. With that, I'm going to allow for my colleagues to speak before I do regarding this discussion, and I did notice that board member Tilly had her hand up initially, so I'll begin the board discussion with board member Tilly. Thank you, President Richardson. I, I have experienced tonight what many of our students and families have experienced when using Chromebooks, and that is that the camera breaks and then I have to log out and log back in. I've also come back to my desktop. That is not to say that the um, uh, efforts in, and the accomplishments of our district in providing each of our students with access to technology and access to Wi-Fi is unappreciated or is not, not good. It was just um, uh, striking to me that I had to experience that personally in uh, participating tonight. Um, Barty said more than I want to. I really wanted to thank the many, many community members for their emails and letters on the topic of reopening um, our schools. Uh, which is before us tonight. I've read every one of your communications. I've responded to many of them. Board member Tilly. Yes. Just one moment. The moment that we are on this agenda item is for any clarifying questions for the uh, actual presentation um, before we call for the motion. So I just wanna make sure that everyone, if they have any clarifying questions, um, we get those clarified before we do our motion and our discussion. Um, are there okay. any other clarifying questions from any of our board members? Just clarifying questions at this time. Yes. Uh, board member Issa. Mr. President, I hope this is a clarifying question. It's 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 concerning dates. Uh, slide number 28, the presenter mentioned the anticipated uh, April 20th if we are in the orange tier. What I am uh, trying to understand is how many days are left of instruction as of April 20th. We know we know, know as we, of March, there were, there were uh, 13, 14, weeks. 14 weeks. So let us check real quickly. March, March was 13 weeks. So April could, couldn't be 14, could it? No, 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 no. I said uh, March was. Oh, okay. Week, so, so let us check real quickly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
who can get it. It's a race to see who can get it faster, Sheila or uh, Angie or I. Uh, well, when I did it's March, it was Superintendent it was, Corey. It was it's six, seven weeks. How many days seven of weeks. construction? And, and, and how could it be seven weeks if it were okay? Seven weeks from April twentieth. Okay. I just I'm just trying to just see how many dates of, of classroom instruction that is. I'm, I hope it's not a tedious question. It's important to me. I can see Dr. McCabe is counting. I believe I'm counting 34. Okay, thank you. It doesn't appear that we have any other clarifying questions. Do I have a motion? Uh, you do. <laughs> um, hi. So uh, I move to reopen to in-person instruction in the purple tier since the case criteria rate to safely do so has been met today for Solano County Public Health. And the district currently meets the Center for Disease Control Safe School Cre Reopening Criterion. A yes vote on this option would permit our special education and preschool students to return to their classrooms on March 1st, 2021, two weeks before the county is hoped to achieve red tier status and in the middle of vaccinations, which should be available to teachers with priority starting as early as next week, supply permitting. By March 8th of 2021, we may welcome our pre-K and kindergarten students, many of them for the first time, into their classrooms. We've learned so much since the coronavirus first plagued this country and our state and our district one year ago. For the CDC, private schools and public schools in neighboring counties that have remained open in this year have done so without ill effect. The evidence is clear that the risk of virus transmission from children in this age group is very small. We now know that wearing masks, keeping our distance, and washing our hands saves lives. And our district has invested millions of dollars to ensure compliance with the most stringent safety protocols developed so far. And this is all to keep our valued teachers, our staff, and our students safe during in-person instruction for this low-risk group. Every student that has written to me, and there have been many, everyone from as little as kindergarten all the way through high school, save one, there was one who said that she liked to break rules, have promised to wear their masks if we will only let them back into their classrooms. I'm impressed by the flexibility the district has shown and trust the existing solutions for teachers and students and counselors not yet ready to return to in-person instruction because we can provide them with safe alternatives for those that are unable to maintain safety protocols on our site. The social, the emotional, and the educational impacts of one year of school closures will be with our learning community for years to come. There will be no return to normal, but rather we will develop a new normal. I oppose delaying our school's ability to reopen until the county reaches red tier and all teachers have been vaccinated because the district and our board has no control over whether our community continues to act responsibly in following basic safety protocols. And although I support fully the district's commitment to pursuing speedy vaccination to all of our learning community. That is another factor completely outside of our control since we have no power over the vaccine supply. A vote to reopen in red tier may result in a vote to remain in distance learning indefinitely, which unfairly and permanently bars our students from access to in-person instruction, which I think we all agree is the preferred method for teaching. The proposed March 1st and March 8th dates to welcome a small portion of our most at risk, least contagious students into their classrooms 
is two weeks before the forecasted red tier. I hope you will join me in adopting option one tonight. Given very low transmission rates in our students, guidance from the CDC, the American Pediatric Association, and Solano Public Health, I cannot support continued distance learning for all students. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman, quick parliamentary question. If I second, which I'm interested in doing for the sake of discussion, will I be allowed to later vote against this motion, Mr. Chairman? Yes, you can. You will be able to. We will do a roll call vote. Okay. Yeah, I second the motion for discussion purposes. Vice President. No, I am Mr. Chair. Can you call uh, board member Isom and then board member Portero. Yeah, I hate I hate that this parliamentary procedure <laughs> maneuvering may may be questionable at some point, but there are uh four recommendations of motion. So if this motion uh does not pass then another motion will need to be made or a substitute motion can be offered in the midst of this conversation. And I'll, I'll wait until it's my turn. Thank you, board member Eisen. So we have a, it's been first and seconded. Um, so this is the time for our board discussion. So board member Patero, you can proceed. And there's no such thing as a seconded. There's a motion and then a and then a second. It's, I mean, there's there's a first. Are we discussing now? Is that right, Mr. President? Are we discussing? When I was twelve years, when I was nine years old, my family immigrated from Fiji to Tonga. Am I am I vibrating? I understood the language, but I couldn't speak it. And the majority of classes were in Tongan. On top of that, my classmates were ostracized me, they ridiculed me, they called me blacky, they called me skinny. I hated it. But within three months, I learned to speak Tongan, which I still speak today. And I learned what colorism is. I adapted and I survived. When COVID hit every teacher and parents, Districts organized distance learning training for teachers and distributed resources to students. Teachers were thrust into a new school, which is like moving to a new country, teaching a new curriculum to students who speak a different language. And students, students migrated to a virtual classroom where not only did they understand the language, they speak the language. In the book, The Economy, which was published in 2020, the authors, Jason Dorsey and Dr. Villa said, Gen Z has always been able to connect and learn online. As for parents, well, parents' schedules were flipped upside down. But we adapted, some better than others, of course, but we adapted and we've learned. Districts learned where the needs are, provided accommodations. Teachers learned to teach online. And students learned that they're, they don't like being required to be online. And what parents learned is that teaching is hard. Now, the arguments for returning to school boil down to this. Students are struggling and they need to be in school. Students miss their friends, as we've heard this evening. Children's, children are like, less likely to contract the virus. And COVID, as we've heard in the past, Probably comments is no worse than the flu. First, Gen Z has come of age with more outlets for learning than any previous generation in history, according to the previously mentioned Z economy, which means that our students have grown up on the very technology that they are currently using to learn. Second, 
For those falling behind, San Diego Assemblymember Lorena Gonzalez introduced Assembly Bill 104, which would give any parent or guardian the authority to re request that their child be held back a year. Third, there is nothing precluding children from seeing their friends after school outside. And finally, and most important to me, federal data from last fall revealed that those who have died or developed life-threatening complications from COVID have predominantly been children of color. Children of color, and that trend continues this year. Sarah Carpenter, the executive director of a parent advocacy group in Tennessee, told the New York Times on February 3rd that for generations, these public schools have failed us and prepared us for prison. And now it's like they're preparing us to pass away. In this diverse diaspora, a large percentage of their full to soon unified school district students are students of color. Carpenter further said, we know that our kids have lost a lot, but we'd rather our kids be out of school than dead. Not only does COVID predominantly impact the lives of students of color, it disproportionately kills adults of color. Dr. Fauci acknowledged as much in a virtual fireside chat hosted by the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers on January 29th. Now, some have argued that stores like Costco and Target are open, but when we shop, we're constantly moving. We don't huddle in large groups in confined spaces like classrooms. Last month, on the Facilities Committee, Board Member Smith and Board Member Craig Wilson and I visited Mary Bird. The classroom we visited had plexiglass in the corner of the room where the teacher's desk was. Now, the problem with that is that there are typically almost as many adults as there are children, as we were told, in the classroom, which only increases the chances of getting and spreading the virus. We're in the purple tier. And at the Solano County Board Association Committee meeting on Monday evening, I learned that we are the only district in the county that is considering opening in this tier. Now, no one controls what adults do when they're not here, when they're not at school. The holidays resulted in an increase in COVID cases and deaths, and so will the Super Bowl. Meanwhile, the UK, the Brazilian, the South African variants of this virus, which spreads more rapidly, incidentally, is right here in the United States. And the UK variant of the virus is now floating around California. On February 9th, the San Diego Union Tribune reported that seven Escondido high schools placed 188 students and staff on quarantine this month because of possible contact with, with positive cases on campus. And of those studying in the TK through eighth grade hybrid model, a total of 37 employees and students tested positive for COVID this month, and 18 of them were on campus while they were infectious. We're only 11 days in. If we return to school, incorporate test testing, and faculty or staff die from COVID, that can be traced to a school campus, and whose family subsequently sues the district, do we have the funds to cover each and every lawsuit? The American Federation of Teachers reported that more than 530 K through 12 teachers died of COVID in 2020. On January 21st, Patrick Key, Dana Johnson, and Julia Davis died from COVID, according to the Washington Post on January 24th. All three of these people were elementary school teachers in Cobb County School District in Georgia. These were real people. I don't want to open the Daily Republic and read an obituary of one of our teachers or hear of another staff who died of COVID. I don't. We have three and a half months left in this academic year. Students and teachers have settled into a routine. It'll take time for them to come back and get reacclimated, and that's going to be loss of educational time. More important, Faculty and staff probably won't be eligible for vaccines until March or April at the earliest. This decision, colleagues, for me, comes down to life. The life of the teacher 
who like me is a person of color with an underlying condition or has a spouse with an underlying condition or a parent. This decision comes down to the life of a student who looks like my 12 year old granddaughter. Life for me is the ultimate value and must be preserved at all costs. Therefore, I'm asking you, my colleagues, that we stand together and vote for option four to remain online for the rest of the semester. Mr. Chair. Board member Eisen. First, I apologize for my misstatement concerning the second. I apologize publicly to you for that. Um, I would like to offer a substitute motion that we uh, pass option four um, as my colleague just shared her words and reason that I'm offering uh, that substitute motion to select option four is because along with my board colleagues, I've read to all of the emails sent to me. I've heard all of the public comment uh, designed to inform the board. Um, as we can see, there are clear lines drawn concerning what members of the community want to see happen. I heard and I thank the staff for the presentation and for their flexibility. And as you shared, sir, the uh, many hours, late nights, early mornings. But in the presentation, I heard the words anticipated, could, may, possibly, might, in other words, that infer unknown. My decision, my request to select item four is based on the known and the unknown. We know that we are in a pandemic period. We do not know how long we will be in this pandemic and therefore how long we will be in the red tier or any other tier or even what new rules may come out next week. Nor do we know how long it will be before vaccinations will be available to the students and teachers, staff members and all others who have an impact on our children. I'm in support of continuing in virtual learning until the end of the school year instead of continuing to hear updates that will continue to change because we are in a pandemic and continue to make available to any students and parents that need it, the support that they need. We've made available to all additional educational support and I hope that more take advantage of it. And so my motion is that we Decide to select option four. Mr. Chairman, are we discussing the motion? Uh, procedure, are we? As a matter of personal privilege and as a matter of point of order under Robert's rules of order. There is a current motion on the table that has been seconded and is up for a discussion. It sounds very clear to me that at least two board members are going to vote no on that motion, and we can withstand that. But the motion is permitted to be debated. A roll call vote can be called at the conclusion of that motion. If it fails, we can move to the next motion. A substitute motion can be offered on the motion that's on the floor. It's not a friendly amendment. I don't accept it. It's not. A, it's, I'm not offering a friendly amendment whatsoever to your motion. I'm offering a substitute motion and I'm calling for a second if there is one. I will second that, Mr. Isom. Now, does that mean the first motion is now off the table, Mr. Chairman? No, no, no it does not. We'll call vote on the motion. Colleagues, let's bring this meeting into order. So we currently have a motion that's on the on the floor. The initial motion was us to open in option one. Board member Isom has requested for there to be an, a substitute motion um, for to the original motion. So how we will proceed is that we're going to continue to debate on the initial motion. If that motion fails, 
then we will consider the substitute motion that was offered by board member Ison. Parliamentary procedure. You have your hands up. I move to vote. Can I make them up? Can we just vote I, on I the object. first motion? We have, we have not finished discussion on the first motion. I object to a vote. Well, there had to be a second to her motion, and that would become the primary motion. Uh, sister, uh, so, so what you have, if, if there's no second on, on Judy's, then you got two motions. So the second motion is what you vote on, and then you go back to the primary motion. That's how that works. The secondary motion. Well, I prefer one chairman at a time. Mr. Chairman, what will the procedure be that we're following? The procedure will be as I discussed. We will continue the discussion on the initial motion. And if that motion fails after we've con con completed our discussion, then we will consider the secondary option offered by board member Ison. Board member Wilson, do you have um, comments regarding this item, the initial, the initial motion? Yes, no, no I, I'd like to offer comments on the original motion. Thank you. And my hand was raised. Um, of the four options that we have to choose from, one, reopen as soon as possible while we're in the purple. Two, reopen after we reach red status. Option three, reopen after orange status. Or four, not reopen this year. I, I'm not comfortable with option one, opening now, then I, I won't vote for that. I'm also not comfortable with option four, not reopening this year, and I would not vote to support that. Uh, I favor option two, but could support option three. Um, I have a statement prepared, but I'll hold it until there's a motion that I could support. Thank you. Board member Honey Church. Thank you. Um, I too do not support uh, option one, the purple going back that soon. Um, however, uh, I don't think I really support saying absolutely we cannot come back until the fall because everything is changing so quickly. Um, if if we choose an option, say red or orange, then we have more flexibility. What I'm concerned about is if we say we don't go back to in-person learning until August, what about summer school? What happens then? Um, if we're in an orange at that time, uh, we've made the decision that we have to wait till August. I, so I'm leaning more toward option two or option three, the red or the orange um, for me. And I, I understand uh, the dilemma with both. I, I feel that those that want to come back, students who want to come back should be able to come back and options for teachers. If they are not wanting to come back, if they are unsafe, then there are options for them and we need to have that option available. But I think coming back in the purple is just a little too soon. Thank you, board member Honeychurch. Board Member Smith, do you have any comment or discussion for the initial motion? No, what I was, hopefully you can hear me now. I've switched to paying um, on my phone um, as opposed to on the laptop. Um, I just wanted to echo earlier um, the comments by Board Member Tilly, and I was attempting to second your motion. Um, so I, I think we have thirds um, as far as that goes. Okay. My feedback on this item is that I recognize the impact of how the pandemic has disrupted education in a significant way. Um, even to the extent at which today, while driving through our community, I was able to encounter one of our staff members from student services completely unplanned in a neighborhood doing a intervention for students 
that were completely disconnected from distance learning. Um, the fact that I was able to be present, again, not scheduled, not planned, just recognizing our staff and the community doing their best to provide interventions, I was able to see firsthand in a real way outside of the public comments, outside of the emails, how students were directly impacted with the distance learning. I've also vacillated with recognizing that there are so there, there are districts throughout the state that have chosen to open. Um, there are some that have chosen not to open. Um, our district has worked diligently at providing resources, supports, um, PPE. Um, in addition to that, the uh, that just the heavy lifting that's been done to support restoring some sense of normalcy and or giving some confidence to our students and stakeholders um, that we want them to not only move forward academically, but we also want them to begin to see that their future is not a reflection of the reality that has discouraged them more times than not. So I support option one, recognizing that option one allows for our district to do a phase in um, that allows for some of our most at-risk student population to return to edu to, to in-person instruction. And that my support of option one is because I recognize that our teachers will be able to come in in smaller numbers instead of us having a wide blanket opening of our district. That is my position. I recognize that there will be a significant number of people that disagree with me. There may be a significant people that support this decision, but the, the bottom line is, is that our, our students' futures are in the balance. I've seen some realities um, from both sides. It's an extremely difficult decision and I have to go with my conscience based upon what I understand, know, and I've experienced firsthand. That concludes my statement regarding the initial motion. For President Richardson, we do need to check. If you wouldn't mind just having us stop because I do believe that we will have to vote on the um, second motion. So if we could just give us a few minutes to research that. Sure. Would it be okay if we let Chantel Martino speak while you're doing that because she raised her hand? Absolutely. Student board member Martino. Thank you, President Richardson. Tonight, I sit here representing all students throughout the district, elementary and secondary, and I want to partake in making a decision that reflects that. I understand that not only distance learning, but the pandemic itself has taken a toll on the well being, mental health, and physical health of my friends, classmates, and all students. However, I also understand that every student has had a different experience during this entire season. And I understand that experience for many students, families, and staff has been difficult. Distance learning isn't ideal for a lot of students and families at this time, but it's also important to be mindful of the physical and mental health of the students, the staff, families, and our community. Um, this decision will only affect students and staff, but the people who live with them and those around them as well. I'm glad that our district has a detailed plan to ensure safety, but I want students to be able to learn in an environment and teachers to teach in an environment where they are not on the edge of their seat, wondering if they're going to bring the virus home. I want students and teachers to be able to learn and teach properly, comfortably and efficiently in the environment that they're in. Many students have learned to adapt to distance learning and returning back to school after almost an entire year would lead students to have to adapt to in-person learning once again. However, I know that there's also students who cannot learn in distance learning and are negatively impacted by it. 
honestly, it scares me. It's a great fear of mine to hear that my friends, my family, my teachers, people I know lost the battle to COVID. And so with all of this being said, I want to support safety and I also want to support mental health. I want to support life. And so I do not support option one and instead I am leaning towards option three. Thank you. Thank you, student board member Chantel Martino. Board member Richardson, my hands up. Board member Tilly. Um, my question is whether we are permitted to call the question uh, and vote on option one while we wait for a ruling on option two. I suspect it will go down, in which case we can then do option uh, or the supplemental motion. I don't want to be out of order, but I would call the question. It doesn't, there doesn't appear to be further discussion on the main motion, which is to reopen in purple tier now. Thank you, Helen. That was the verbiage I was trying to think of. Call the question. <laughs> I, I believe, though, what we're seeing is that because the second motion was amended, amended of the first, there was just the end that changed, and it you got a second. It wasn't an amendment. It was a substitute. It was I a mean, sorry, motion. substitute. Thank you. And it got a second that we do have to vote first on that motion. The substitute motion to not reopen um, the school year. Okay, call the becomes question. Becomes the primary motion. Yeah. Well, it, it becomes the motion. We call the question, and if it goes, if it passes, then that's the law. If it fails, then we go to the underlying motion, which was correct. 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 So we have a first and a second uh, motion. A motion on the. Substitute motion. Who did the there second on David's motion? Anna. Oh, thank you. Roll call vote, please. And can we just clarify what the motion is one more time? Board member Isom. Restate the motion that we're voting on right now, please. That we select four as a criteria for opening schools. If this mo and I'm and Craig, I apologize if you think I'm being the chair, but I'm trying to help us navigate parliamentary procedure. So what would happen is if this motion does fail, the original motion becomes the motion. If it fails, then there is an opportunity for another motion. Concur. Ms. Martino. Hold on, wait. Okay, so we need a mo for a motion. Is no, we need a roll call. call. Okay. Roll call. <laughs> no, we need a roll call a, on my motion, which was seconded. A clarification on the procedure that we need to take. What you guys didn't see was staff kind of rushing and trying to provide some additional direction. On this. So we're, we're going. We've like never had this situation happen with yeah. us. <laughs> so now, now you need to vote as to whether or not the new motion and second can become the motion on the floor. Okay. So we're not voting. Sure. We're not voting on the motion to remain in distance learning. You are voting to have the substitute motion become the motion on the floor. Okay. And the substitute motion is to is number four, right? Correct. 
So and, David, and so, courtesy, if David and, has a courtesy, can you repeat the motion? I no, move that it's 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 not a motion. Sorry, we are now voting. Yay right, we're voting on, on on my on my, but he was just asking me to re, re, repeat it so everyone understands. But we're not voting You're, on what I want. We're voting on whether or not it becomes a primary motion. Correct. Correct. That's what we're doing. Okay. Okay. So okay. David, if you can repeat that so that we can just be clear on what the the substitute. What I am trying to make the is. primary motion is that we select option four. Okay, and and if we vote no, we don't want that to be the primary motion. Then does that that's not like saying no? We just go back to Helen's motion and vote on that. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're voting to make David's motion the primary motion. May I have a roll call? Ms. Martino. Mm -hmm. Ms. Martino? Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch? This is just not voting on the motion, but just whether it's going to be the first motion, and I vote nay. I don't want it to be the first motion. Mr. Isom? The primary vote motion. Yay. Ms. Patero? Aye. Mr. Richardson? No. Ms. Smith? Nay. Nay. Ms. Tilly? Nay. Nay. Mr. Wilson? Nay. That motion failed. We're back to the initial motion, which was to open with option one. May I call the question? Has everyone had a chance to uh, comment on that motion? Yes, board member Wilson. I think so. comment. May I have a roll call? Ms. Martino? Nay. Mrs. Honeychurch? Nay. Mr. Isom? Nay. Ms. Patero? Nay. Mr. Richardson? Yes. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Tilly? Aye. Mr. Wilson? If I understand the motion correctly, to choose option one, I vote nay, no. That motion fails. Now, now there's a motion in the distance. So now, I, can we make another motion? Yes, absolutely. So if the floor is open, then um, and we are not able to open in the purple tier, I think that the next best option is option two. And so my motion is for that. Second. Can you can you instead of saying option two, say what the motion is please opening for in-person instruction in the red tier point of information or point of clarification is a red does a red tier include vaccinations for teachers no does the yellow tier no okay so we have a first and a second Roll call vote. I think this, I think uh, discussion. Discussion. To discuss. My apologies. My apologies. Any board discussion? Board member Honeychurch, followed by board member w Wilson, and then followed by board member Patero. Oh, uh, I just wanted to quickly say that I too read all of the emails, the multiple emails that I received, and some were heartbreaking and and very straightforward and 
on all sides. So this is indeed a difficult decision. I'm leaning toward being safe. Um, I think the safety factor is huge um, for all of us. Uh, where I'm vacillating is between red and orange. Um, the, my fear in orange is that we're, it's going to be too little. It'll be we'll be back in class for such a very short period of time. And that's not good. Um, so I'm, I'm wanting to hear from my colleagues on your thoughts on red and orange. Thank you, board member Honeychurch, board member Wilson. Okay, this is a motion that I could support either two or an option, uh, either two or three. So let me do my spiel, my statement, if I may. Um, <clears throat> I also would like to acknowledge all the people who took time to express their opinion and feelings about this issue. Although I rarely respond personally, I always listen to or read every comment. Almost all of them are deeply honest and sincere. We're not counting for and against, we're listening. This isn't just some political campaign, these are life stories. To each of you, thank you for taking the time. Now, of the four options, I favor two, which would be the red tier. I could support the orange tier, three, but I, I'm not comfortable with either one immediate opening or not opening at all. Now, I, uh, we have not eliminated the risk. You know, why do I support reopening at all? Here's my explanation of that. We, we do have good knowledge on how to manage that risk. Over the last 10 months, we've watched schools around us and around the country that opened and seen what happened. Yes, there are new variant strains of the virus to be concerned about, but the consensus remains that carefully using protective protective equipment can keep the risk of infection low enough to reopen. The state has indicated they will support us in reopening if we choose that, but we need to keep the pressure on the state to accelerate vaccinations so that all school staff can have access to them. When we do reopen, it will not be all grade levels or all classes equally. It will be phased in by priority, and even then, for only two and a half hours in the morning for elementary students, middle and high schools would remain in distance learning in the morning, but will be allowed to come in the afternoon. Parents will be able to choose their comfort level. If they want their students to remain home in distance learning, they can make that choice and keep their students in the same class. School employees, however, will not be able to choose their comfort level. School employees are classified as essential workers. The work won't be pain-free and it won't be risk-free, just as with other essential workers. Teachers will have to carefully follow unpleasant safety practices using uncomfortable safety equipment. It won't be a return to normal, and we can't take for granted the close teaching and learning environments we've had in previous years, but it will be there for those students who choose it. There will still be many unknowns. There will be more surprises and infections and disruptions to people's lives even when schools were closed to in-person attendance the last 10 months, many families and children have contracted COVID and been seriously affected. But if we're waiting until there is no more anxiety, we'll be waiting for a long time. We shouldn't ignore the anxiety, but we can look for solid information on what preventative steps will reduce the risk. I have sympathy for those who are deeply uncomfortable about this, and I know there are many, the district is going to great lengths to provide safety equipment, but 
teachers will need to go to great lengths in their classrooms to keep the risk of infection as low as possible. It's a huge burden for employees from top to bottom. We only choose it because of our responsibility to students and to the community. Lastly, if the county, state, or federal government advises us to close again, we'll do so. We can halt at any time if the recommendations change. But in the meantime, I will vote to reopen when we reach the red tier, and I favor option two. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Wilson. In the order that hands went up, Board Member Patero followed by Board Member Tilly. Thank you. I cannot reiterate enough the dangers to people's lives. When we come back, there are classes that have upwards of over 30 students in the classroom. How are we going to get distance learning? Dr. Walensky, the director of the CDC, said that density is one of the, one of the cate categories in terms of coming back. 35 students in a classroom. And when we go to the TK classrooms, our superintendent said that there are going to be almost as many adults in the classroom as there are students. And those children, many of them with special needs, may not even have to wear masks. And as I said earlier, those who are predominantly affected by this are people of color, students of color. We have teachers here of color who live in three generation homes. That's my biggest concern. And just to answer what Mr. 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 Wilson said, opening and closing will further disrupt our students. As I said, they're on a routine. Some people are, are, are thriving. Some are not, not, understandably, but they will come back next year. A dead teacher won't. We're not Lazarus here, and there's no second coming. Thank you, Board Member Patero. Board Member Tilly. Uh, thank you, President Richardson, and thank you to my board members, because I know that we've all been listening and reading and trying to both understand and appreciate the fear as well as understand and appreciate the need. Um, reopening in red tier means that vaccines are in the arms of our teachers. Reopening in red tier means that transmission rates are so low as to be almost negligible. Reopening in red tier, if it's the soonest we can welcome our children and our students and our teachers and our counselors and our certificated staff or clerical staff back into the classroom, it has my full support. Board member Isom, I can't see you on screen, so I'm not sure if you have your hand raised. I just wanted to check I do not. to confirm. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Board member Honeychurch. Um, thank you. I now just totally lost my train of thought. Um, oh, going back to what board member Petrero was saying about 30 in a classroom, um, that would not be able to happen. Um, if we have guidelines that we have to be so many feet apart and we have to have small cohorts of people, we would not be able to go back with 30 kids in the classroom. And I don't think 30 people would go back, 30 students would go back. I think we'll probably have maybe half go back. But when I was talking to Superintendent Corey and asking about the 20 to one in uh, special ed classes and the concern that of the number of adults and the number of students needed for special ed, um, I was under the impression that if we have too many people, then we won't be able to take that, that those number of students back in and we might have to revise the plan. So it wouldn't be that we would just automatically put, you know, over 20 or over the number that would be safe in the classroom automatically. I hope I understood that correctly. Thank you, board member Honeychurch. I I'm, I don't even know what words to say right now. Uh, so there is so much impacting our community. 
and I've known since March of last year that this was going to be an extremely heavy decision that we would have to bear. There was no way around it. Our discussions through the summer of, of planning to reopen because we had no guidance from our state leaders or our federal leaders was a hope and good faith of proper planning to prevent poor performance while still moving forward with the mantra of carrying education forward, recognizing that we can't count time that we lose in the future. We've had two failed motions tonight and I'm supporting the next best option, which is to open in red. I'm not gonna belabor it much longer. Board member Ison. Thank you, I have a quick question. Um, would it be uh, a friendly amendment, not a substitute motion? We're not gonna go through what we just went through. Would it be, would it be a friendly amendment? Um, I forgot who made the motion. Uh, that vaccinations be taken into consideration prior to opening. Um, what I think that would mean is that the um, presentation, of course, it would change a little bit just to say that, but that's what I'm asking in conversation. Um, would that be a friendly amendment to the motion for opening in, in, in either tier that passes? I am not interested in making that a, a part of our reopening plan as board member Tilly had said earlier, that is not something that was is within our control. Um, our county public health official doesn't seem to have interest in moving uh, staff up the line. And if that is the case, then there's the potential that somebody who is like me that is not on the list at all may not get the vaccine for a long time. And, and there are just a lot of variables. So I, I'm opposed to that amendment. Thank you. Any other friendly discussions regarding David's friendly amendment? Board member Patero. I would wholeheartedly support Mr. Isom's friendly amendment if we're adding vaccines to the red tier. And the Biden administration did say that within 100 days, that gives us till April to get the vaccines. But he's also said that by summer, everyone should be vaccinated. So I would gladly support vaccinate, adding vaccinations. So if I could, um, that that was my motion that he was wanting to amend. And so that I'm, I'm opposed to that. And I would like to call the question to take a vote. Didn't I just second that? Mr. Eisen's friendly amendment? No. No, it, 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 it needed to be, a, it needed to be accepted by the maker of the motion. Uh, Just for clarification, the motion and the vote is to open as soon as possible once we've met the criteria in the red. Which option? Can we, can we have an option? We have two left. I Which option is it? It said option two okay. that we discussed. Mm -hmm. And just remember, all of those are anticipated dates because you have to be in the red tier for five days before we can start our phase in approach. Okay, so it will depend on when we get in the red tier. Yes, that is correct. Perfect. Ms. Martino. Nay. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Nay. Ms. Patero? Nay. Mr. Richardson? Yes. Ms. Smith? Aye. 
Ms. Tilly? Aye. Mr. Wilson? In favor of the motion, yay. That motion passes. I do want to take the liberty um, to thank everyone for their patience and willingness and understanding. I do recognize that there are going to be individuals who are not going to be happy with this decision. Um, and there clearly will be people that are happy about this decision. But what I encourage all of us to do is to move forward, recognizing that we're doing everything humanly possible together as a community to make sure that we safely move forward. Um, I did mention to the superintendent um, that if we have any critical information that comes out that can impact our decision tonight, that I will be leaning in favor of establishing a special board meeting so that we can address that immediately and not push it into a future board meeting. So again, I, I trust that you as community members, those viewing and our colleagues together that we will continue to move forward together in a united front, recognizing that this is not a battle about who's right, who's wrong, but it's really about finding a way to move forward and not remain stagnant. That's it, it's critically important that we do that. So thank you, thank I thank everyone, my colleagues in the community for your patience, your commitment, your determination, and every other attribute that I have not named that has contributed to this process. I do thank you. May I ask a question just for clarification and um, for a special board meeting, what sort of lead time there is between the establishing and the meeting itself? We need to have two days. Did you want to take just maybe a five minute recess? Yes, let's take a five minute recess.
Fellow board members, I'm going to need to adjourn for about 10 minutes in order to transfer rooms in order to permit my husband to work in our home office. So I will be right back, okay? <laughs> Thank you. We're now returning to resuming our meeting. We're on item 14B. Review and potential approval of the 2021 California School Boards Association CSBA Delegate Assembly election ballot. Uh, board colleagues, you've received the ballot, and we have David, Dr. David C. Isom, um, who has faithfully, consistently represented us through CSBA, um, who is recommending that he be nominated um, as our as a representative for delegate for our area. Move approval. Um, Second. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> Vote by acclamation. It's also for Diane. Okay, and for Diane Fruit. Oh, okay, I see it from Venetia Unified School District. So we have a first and a second. Judy. Hi. Do we have any public comments on this item? 
There are no public comments on this item. Any board discussion? Roll call. Ms. Martino. Ms. Martino. Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch. Aye. Mr. Isom. Aye. Ms. Patero. Aye. Mr. Richardson. Aye. Smith. Aye. Ms. Tilly. Ms. Tilly. Okay. okay. You just rejoined. Yes, I'm here. Board member Tilly, we're voting on item 4B, 14B, the review and potential approval of the 2021 California School Boards Association CSBA Delegate Assembly election ballot. And that includes um, our own um, David C. Isom and Diane Ferrucci. And we had a first and a second, and we've just done a roll call vote. We're just waiting for you. Ms. Tilly? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. And a student preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That motion passes. Thank you, colleagues. You're welcome, sir. Item 14C review and potential approval of the proposed amendment to employment agreement for Superintendent Kristen Corey. Do we have any public speakers? We have one request for public comment. If they're still present, Mr. George Gwynn, please come to the microphone. Here we go. Uh, good evening once again. Um, can, I hope you can hear me. In, anyway, um, uh, good evening once again. Um, um, I um, hope that um, the uh, superintendent gets to stick around. I think that uh, she's been doing a pretty good job. Um, I don't uh, see a request for more money. That was one thing that's kind of hard to get out of me because I'm here to represent the taxpayers and the taxpayers really uh, have to pay through the nose a lot of times. But I think uh, the superintendent has been doing a very good job and I think that uh, she needs to be supported. And uh, this is not a good time to change the leadership. So I hope uh, this is no brainer. Um, thank you very much. There are no more public comments. Thank you, Board Member Wolfson. I'd like to move approval on this item. And okay. I would also like to mention, uh, since there was a public commenter earlier uh, that spoke to the um, possibility that the last time we voted on this, the su superintendent had stated that she was not going to request this once again. And that is not how this wound up on the agenda. It was at the request of board members. And so I just wanted to clarify that for the record and I move approval. Second, uh, thank you, uh, Bethany, for that. You are you are 100 percent correct. This was brought up by the board during the evaluation. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that, Bethany. Do we have any board discussion? Uh, board member Portero, followed by board member Tilly, and then board member Wilson. I just wanted to clarify when we had this discussion, I have some, some criteria that I wanted in terms of areas for growth and improvement, that's not going. That is that part of this, or does that become finalized with the, with the superintendent's contract at the end of this year? Like, what are we going to end the contract to twenty four without any of the criteria that we had with that we discussed? So to clarify that, so you're referring to an evaluation? Yeah. Correct. So that was not the complete evaluation. So you're referring to the mid-year, which is a basically progress report. So when you are looking for those areas for strengths and improvements that are more hardcore and finalized, those are items that will be discussed at a later time. 
So then now I think it's a bit premature to extend, vote to extend the contract to an extra two years if we haven't even discussed. I think that would be a bit more prudent to do that at the end of the next, when we have all the criteria, criteria set. Because I think just to vote here with no extra criteria that we voted on, that we talked about, to just extend it to 24, wouldn't be fair because, because now we're saying, oh, we're voting to, to, to amend it to 20, to give her an, a con to give a superintendent a contract to 2024 when we haven't even discussed or finalized the added criterion, create criteria for her in order to have something to which to a goal, a measurable goal to attain. Does that make sense? Because if we're just extending a, a contract to 24 with the same criteria, of this current contract, I don't think that's fair or reasonable or makes any sense, particularly in light of the fact that we did have areas for improvement or areas to not necessarily for improvement, areas to add to. So if we just blindly extend the contract to 24 without discussing that and having anything in writing, then that becomes 24. Does that make sense? I wanna see something before we just extend the contract two extra years. That's my point. Thank you, Board Member Patero. Board Member Tilly. Board Member Tilly, you're on mute. I have a different recollection, and um, I think that um, Board Member Patero presumes agreement, and that's not necessarily what um, I believe uh, was uh, the outcome of what was a glowing, unanimous, amazing endorsement of the incredible work of a superintendent that we're lucky to keep for two years. The fact that she would stay with us without a request for more money, the fact that even George Gwynn, hi, Mr. Gwynn, <laughs> agrees she's doing a phenomenal job in the most difficult circumstances that any of us have faced in a lifetime is more than sufficient to me to express wonder and gratitude and to fully support the contract extension here, here, Helen. Thank you, Board Member Tilly. Board Member Wilson, did I? Yes, um, I, you know, before I was on the board, I did not understand the, you know, the purpose of the compensation structure for the executives in our district. I've only been on the board two years, but I'm starting to see there are places you scrimp and save and save a few pennies, save a few dollars and places that it doesn't make sense to scrimp and save. You know, we could uh, replace Chris with a, a newbie who would work for half her wage, but we'd be so, we'd be so sorry, so fast. I, I don't, I don't want to go there. Um, I, I think there's misunderstandings in the community. I know I did not understand it when I was just a member of the community that, uh, you know, she's doing what we want. I heard there was one uh, school employee said, I have never seen that board stand up to Chris. That's a misunderstanding. She does what we want. Her job is, it's an impossible job to read our minds and try and uh, try and support us in us making our decisions. And uh, I solidly think she's worth uh, what we're paying her and worth extending as long as we have her, it can only go downhill after we lose her. I mean, we'll raise it up again, but right now we have a solid, you know, one of the, one of the top tier of the state and uh, we're just lucky to have her. And uh, I think this is the appropriate time. I sus it might be overdue compared to the other executives. I forget exactly, but um, I fully support this motion and we'll vote for it. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Wilson. Board Member Isom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when this came up, uh, as 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 uh, Ms. Tilly shared, it was after we uh, went over uh, the mid-year evaluation. At which point, we shared where we what we felt at that time. There will be a time in the next several months where we have the final evaluation. Um, not in 2024, but in the next uh, several months, where we have the final evaluation when we 
list those things that we'd like to see going forward. So I just wanted to make sure that my colleague understood that what's um, what we talked about at the progress report at the mid-year evaluation is when we say what we'd like to see going forward. And that's where we will be in a few more in a few more months at the final evaluation. I support wholeheartedly um, and I appreciate the board president and the vice president putting this on the agenda. That's how items are agendized. Thank you, board member Eisen. Board member Honeychurch, did you have any feedback? I just wanted to confirm. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I, thank I just you. was loved what Helen said. I couldn't agree with you more. So I just was concurring with my colleagues. Thank you. Board member Patero, did you have another yeah. question? Yeah, I I didn't expect it to be on the, on the agenda. And I know that we thought we discussed this. And when we said, okay, I thought we were going to write something down so that we have a solid measurable unit before we we uh, extended the, uh, the superintendent's contract to 24. I know we said, yeah, and I do agree. I, I said she was a problem solver. I said that was wonderful. But I did also have extra additional things to work on. So when I saw this on the agenda, I didn't realize it was going to be on the agenda. And I even spoke to the superintendent about it. I said, yeah, you're because I read the contract and it expires in two years and we discussed it. So moving it to two years, it's just two extra years, right? But if we came back to it and we talked about it and we had some criteria, we could have extended a contract, but now it's just two extra years. Does that make sense? And I really wanted to add, and, I, and so I understand that we talked about it, but I wanted to see something in writing is here's what we need to improve. Here's some, something measurable by which we can not grade. I'm not, I'm not a teacher here to assess rather. And that was my only point. That was all I was saying that I was surprised to see it on the agenda. So board member Tilly, just as a reminder, uh, we, we all discussed this um, in some detail with every board member contributing um, their information. And this was something that we discussed um, moving forward with, which required for myself and the vice president to make a decision to agendize. So again, if we go back and revisit that moment, there was really not one negative comment or real significant area of improvement for the progress report considering the pandemic and the untraditional year that we faced. And I believe that was some of the language that uh, multiple colleagues used um, at that time. So just a reminder, what you're concerned about, you still have full opportunity for when the opportunity presents itself at the actual evaluation period. The, okay. the, does that clarify? Okay, at this point, I think we've gone over the, the matter enough and I'd like to call the question. I'm good. Well, not before I would say good, make a comment. <laughs> so, Madam Superintendent, I just wanna say um, as the leader of the board, um, I appreciate your due diligence and your effort that you've exercised in ways that many people will never be able to understand. They will not know the capacity in what we have witnessed behind closed doors. They will not know what we've seen that has been unseen to the community. So we recognize this is an opportunity that is far larger than you because it, it helps to support the team that supports you. So we recognize that you being the phenomenal leader that you've been in the middle of multiple crises, not just the 2020 year, but the years before that, that we had to navigate through. And each of those moments we surfaced as a leader in our region. And if not in our region alone, we surfaced as the leader across this country. And there are still people contacting our district, even in this season, because of your leadership and the team that you've built around you. So we do recognize that this commitment of the board 
to your contract extension is far more significant because it re it helps to reinforce your leadership, but also it allows for there to be confidence in the staff that follow your leadership and allows for us to continue moving forward with continuity and helping to provide the quality education that you dream of for our students and that the community desires. So with that, I say thank you for your contributions and for your sacrifices and for the work that you will continue to dedicate yourself to beyond this moment. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Martino? Aye. Mrs. Honeychurch? Aye. Mr. Isom? Aye, with commendations. Ms. Patero? Aye. Mr. Richardson? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Tilly? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. That motion passes. Moving to item 15A, information items, education services. 15A, review of school site comprehensive safety plans. We'll defer this to Ms. Sheila McCabe. Do we have any public comments? There are no public comments on this item. Ms. McCabe, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Superintendent Corey, Board President Richardson, and Ms. members of the Governing Board. Tonight, we bring forward to you for information each of our school sites, comprehensive site safety plans. This is an annual process where the sites have worked with their school site councils and our safety committees to evaluate their plans and update their plans as necessary. In addition to being reviewed and approved by either the site councils or their safety committees, it's all, they've also been reviewed and approved by the Fairfield Fire Department, Fairfield Police Department, Susun Police Department, and Solano County Sheriff's Office. We will be bringing the plans back next month for potential approval, and then they need to be approved and available in their school offices by March 1st. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCabe. Do we have any clarifying questions from board colleagues? Board member Isom, I see your hand up. Is that intentional? Thank you, sir. Moving to item 15B, we have a written report, the committee's recommendation on local indicators for the state seal of civic engagement. No presentation. Do we have any public comment? There is no public comment on this item. Do we have any board discussion? I do just have a very quick question on who will be reviewing. Um, there are some projects that need to be reviewed. Whose responsibility will uh, that be, Superintendent? Dr. McCabe. Yeah, that'll be a function of, of secondary education working with site teams. Thank you, Dr. McCabe. Moving on to item, I'm oh, sorry, board member Patero. The comment I had, I believe on the third criterion for this uh, civil, civic engagement, I was, the question I have is, will extracurricular activities such as academic decathlon, speech and participating on the speech and debate team, could that, would that count toward that third criterion? Dr. McCabe. Can students participate in academic decathlon or speech and debate to count toward that third criterion? No, because I do not believe so. I think that this is more about a service project. So it's not just participating in an extracurricular activity, but actually conducting some form of a service project that might be um, conducted at the school site or within the community. Any other discussion, board colleagues? Just want to verify. Um, board member Honey Church, I didn't see you on screen. There you go. Thank you. Item 16A presentation discussion on established budget priorities based on identified district needs and goals and on realistic projections of available funds for the 2021 2022, according to board policy 3100. Um, this is going to be deferred to Mrs. Michelle Henson. Do we have any public comment? No public comment. Ms. Henson, you may begin. 
Thank you. Just give me an opportunity here to have BBC shut down their present presenting and I can turn mine on. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Richardson, Governing Board Members and Superintendent Corey. Item 16A on tonight's agenda will begin our conversation on the governor's budget proposal and how that affects our budget priorities for the upcoming budget year. Back last spring when we were in the stages of developing our budget and the local control accountability plan, the pandemic hit. And as a result, the state suspended the LCAP and created the learning continuity and attendance plan in its place. The district had begun its work to develop new goals for the LCAP at that time and here are those goals in their proposal form. Execute equitable, high quality programs and options for students. Fully implement a tiered integrated social emotional program to support all students. Implement a rigorous routine and develop staff. Create safe, inclusive learning environment and engage parents, families and community partners to promote student success. Goal number one will focus on providing professional development for certificated staff on the implementation of universal design for learning and continuing to implement multi-tiered systems of support. Goal number two will focus on implementing healing-centered engagement and identifying and implementing a tiered K-12 social emotional program. Goal number three will create and implement a plan to hire staff that is reflective of our learning content community and ensure that all staff receive the necessary support to be successful and remain a part of our FSUSD team. Goal number four, complete facilities projects, ensuring all have access to safe learning environments and expanding the implementation of Check and Connect. Goal number five will target the creation and distribution of the engaged newsletter and the five minute Friday information videos, along with expanding the access of parent cafes. Here are the revenues estimated for FSUSD based on the governor's 2021 budget proposal. The district expects to receive approximately 203 million in LCFF funding, slightly higher than last year if this proposal comes to fruition. Of course, it isn't as simple as here's 203 million, how should we spend it? There are some existing ongoing expenses we must take into, consider into consideration. For example, salaries and benefits make up about 85% of the district's general fund budget. And each year, the district must plan for the step and column salary increases. Because benefits are a percentage factor of salaries, as salaries increase, so do benefits. Rising employee pension rates are just one component of the rising benefits costs, and we have been watching those closely. Depending on where STRS and PERS rates are finalized, the district is looking at significant increases to pension costs year to year. Another consideration that is taken into account when we are going through and developing the budget is the board's commitment to ongoing salary compensation and its role in the multi-year projection. We are fortunate in that we as a district and with the board support have kept the district's financial outlook on solid footing and have been able to sustain over 17% in total compensation increases in the last seven years. And that's something to really be proud of. This slide lists our previously established board priorities. These are often reflected in our special reserve funds or our designations made in the ending fund balance of the general fund. For ongoing deferred maintenance, we have set aside an amount of 1.25% of general fund expenditures. There is a 500,000 transfer made annually to Fund 20 to contribute towards our post-employment retiree benefits and 2.5 million for future textbook adoption, 1.8 million for technology, 500 specifically for Measure J projects, 500,000 for safety and security, and another 500,000 for playground repairs and replacement. These priorities will be reviewed along with the proposed LCAP goals as cabinet begins their conversations over the next month and prepares to bring the board a recommendation to kick off the 2021-22 budget development cycle. As we hold discussions, these are the items on the horizon that we still need to talk about. Stakeholder feedback on the proposed LCAP goals, any potential salary agreements, continued rising pension costs, the need for bus and fleet replacement as that has not been addressed, costs associated with the reopening of schools, and last but not least, will 
the May revise look better or worse than the governor's current proposal? Thank you for this opportunity to update you on where we are to date in our budget development cycle. Board President Richardson, I'll turn this back over to you. Madam Henson, thank you so much for your presentation and also for your due diligence for helping us to continue to be financially solvent as a district. Uh, board colleagues, um, are there any clarify questions or discussion regarding this item? I don't appear to see any. Board member Patero. I'm gonna keep us until then. All right. So I just have a couple of comments on, on each of the um, on the bell caps on one three and four specifically on uh, the equitable in increase in quality education. Uh, of, is this where we can add or incorporate ethnic studies? Is this, is this where we can add um, areas to to support these different LCAPs? Can we add something to it? Like maybe add some ethnic studies or number three in terms of increased hiring in terms of a the hiring, I'd like to see us hire more teachers of color, for example. I'd like to see, for example, black male teachers are considered unicorns. I'd like to see that added to our, to L to it, this, it, this isn't about the LCAP, this is about the budget. So, oh, yeah, I'm this sorry, am I on the wrong one? No, you're on the right one. It's but just those are being candidate? identified, but they're not, it's, we're not determining anything in regards oh, so to the LCAP. This is only it. about the budget. Mm, okay, never mind. Board member Tilly, I saw your hand. All right, thank you, colleagues. We are now at item 16B, notice of upcoming bids. There's no presentation. Do we have any public comment? No public comment. Have any board discussion? I see none. We've now arrived at the coveted item number 21. Adjournment. Tonight we will be adjourning our board meeting and the honor and memory of Linda Samara, Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District's maintenance secretary, Dale McGee, uncle of Travis Nelson, assistant principal of B. Gail Wilson. Cross Scott, grandson of Tracy Lewis, assistant principal at Dan Root Health and Wellness Academy, and Randall Ray DeGracia, father of Aaron DeGracia, assistant principal at the Fairfield Sassoon Adult School. May they rest in peace and may their memories be a blessing. This evening's meeting is now adjourned.